chance to participate in a discussion with one of today's leading historians. Join us as Book TV's In Depth welcomes Joyce Appleby, Professor Emerita of History at UCLA, and past president of both the Organization of American Historians and the American Historical Association. She's most recently the editor of the Best American History Essays, 2006. Joyce Appleby, in a recent book of essays that you edited, you refer to something called Founder's Chic. You say that the fact that David McCullough's book, John Adams, has sold two million copies is, quote, an indication of just how much the reading public has succumbed to Founder's Chic. What is it and what do you mean by that? Well, I, it isn't my phrase. I don't know who thought it up. But it, it refers to the fact that in the last, I'd say, 10, 12 years, there's just been dozens of books written about Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, notably, mm -hmm. with the McCullough biography, Benjamin Franklin this year. Um, and people are just seem to be lapping up these books about the founding era. There, many books are about two or three founding fathers who are either rivals or studies of character. Uh, it's, it's been sort of fascinating. I became aware of it when I was asked to review books, and I would never, rarely would I be given one book, I'd be given four books to review because they'd come out at the same time and they all dealt with the founding era. Now, there have been a lot of books over the years written about oh, the yes, founding fathers. Right. Does, does that in and of itself um, st uh, say about, what does it say about the two million copies of one book? What does it say I about don't, history? You know, there have been a lot of uh, explanations. I think one, I mean, as you say, it's always been a popular subject. I think perhaps in our time there seems to be more um, ambiguity about our goals or perhaps the, our national identity, and the Founding Fathers just clinch our national identity. They, they remind us that the nation was founded, you know, in a spirit of revolution, but also on the natural rights foundation and that it was seen as a great... Uh, reform movement for mankind as a whole, uh, at least at the understanding of the founders. I think that's it. I think another thing is that for about 40 years among professional historians, there's been a tremendous amount of work on social history, uh, history from the bottoms up, history of, the, of those people who had been silenced in the past, ordinary people, slaves, immigrants, laborers, women. And I think that there was built up a pent-up desire to get back to, you know, you might say, real history. Those guys that fought the revolution and founded the nation and passed the, ratified the Constitution. In, uh, let's see, I think it's been, what, 13 years ago, you wrote the book Telling the Truth About History along with two of your colleagues. Here's one of the things you said, and again, this is 13 years ago. You said professional historians have been so successfully socialized by demands to publish that we have little time or inclination to participate in general debates about the meaning of our work. Is that still happening? I think less so. I think it's less so. I think what I was referring to is the fact that um, historians of my generation and 10, 20 years younger came in in the great expansion of higher education following the uh, Sputnik, when Americans realized that they were sort of behind in science and you can't beef up science without beefing up the social science and the humanities because we give general education to our students to, for the BA degree. and. Uh, that research university put a lot of emphasis upon scholarship and so there was a, it ceased to be rather a leisurely profession in which you would reflect upon things and it was more one of doing research and publishing the books and going to conferences and reviewing other people's books and that doesn't leave a lot of time for reflection but i think i think the profession as a whole is slowing down I, and and there are probably people out there saying oh what are you talking about but at any rate i think there is more of a concern about the meaning is it slowing down at all because the, some historians have been um, having problems with plagiarism issues, or I don't think so. No, you know, I don't think that I don't think there's any increase in plagiarism. I think that there were just some very high-profile cases, uh, and 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 also the press played a part in it. Not a bad part, but the press did pay attention to historians. Whereas I think 20, 40, 60 years ago, it'd be kind of a ho hum thing. Um, Instead of me asking the question, I'll go straight to an emailer, and this woman is Patricia Holler, and she said, how would you classify yourself as a historian? Are you a social historian, new left, or neoconservative? And what other prominent female historians have written about the American Revolution era, era and what are some of their works? Take the first wow. part first. What kind of historian are you? 
I suppose I'm an intellectual political historian. Those are the two fields that I have done my, my original work on. Um, starting with my first book on the sort of the, the foundation of economic, uh, e economic reasoning in the 17th century England. Uh, and continuing with my concern about Jefferson and the Jeffersonians and, and uh, the first generation of Americans. So that's where I am. Um, I don't know whether, uh, I think the questioner also wanted to know politically where mm -hmm. I was. Uh, personally, politically, I would say I'm on the left, but as an historian, I'm probably seen as uh, a little right center because I've always looked at the development of capitalism positively and tried to connect it with what I thought were the actual decisions people made that led to the flourishing of a free enterprise. Uh, economy and that's led to my having a number of conservative graduate students and because it was seen that I wasn't hostile to these things. Uh, Jan Lewis has written about this revolutionary era. She and Peter Onuf have uh, edited a series at the University of Virginia that have worked on Jefferson's legacy. They did a collection of books on Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Um, other women who learned were uh, Linda Kerber who's the current president of the American Historical Association, has worked on the Revolutionary Era, as has Mary Beth Norton, uh, and they have, uh, their earlier works, their second books really, uh, have been on women in the American Revolution. Uh, Laurel Ulrich at um, uh, Thatcher at um, Harvard has worked on women in the um, Revolutionary Era. That's a sampling of them. Here are two of your uh, recent books that came out. One, a biography, the sh short biography of Thomas Jefferson. This is uh, from the Henry Holt collection. What yes. is this about, the, the series? Well, it, it, it's about presidents. And um, probably there are 20, 24 presidential biographies uh, that have so far been published. And I did the one on Jefferson. So it's, it's short because the series is, is a short uh, series. It, it's, it's what I consider um, an airport. Book. You buy it for a flight home. I, I think you could go from maybe finish it by the time you went to Chicago. Certainly by the time you got to L.A. And it's about Jefferson as president. This is a this is the whole list of people mm -hmm. who are now mm -hmm. writing about the different different presidents. Uh, they're you're at least halfway through. Uh, what do you think about Henry Holt deciding the publisher deciding to put this series together? I think it's very interesting. It's been quite successful, and I think there, uh, I think people are inclined to read one or two and and like them and think, hmm, you know, there's some unknown. I don't know anything about Buchanan. I don't know anything about uh, Fillmore. I think I'll I'll read these other biographies, and and I think that's an excellent thing. I think uh, I think political history is important because it's a backbone of history, whether we like it or not. It is the 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 spine because policies are made and power is centered there and um, a great deal of the public discourse is shaped by politics. Uh, I'm going to talk more about Jefferson later but I want to get into this book a little bit. Oh. Inheriting the Revolution. Right. When did you write it and what when how did you come up with the premise? I think it was published in 2000. Um, Harvard University Press published it. I worked on it for about 10 years. I, there was an awful lot of debate, uh, not debate really, there were an awful lot of assertions about what happened after the revolution, what impact the revolution had on American society. And I thought it would be interesting to test some of these assertions because they really came out of a very generalized knowledge and perhaps the proclivities of the scholar making them. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to study the first generation of Americans, that is to say those people, the first cohort that was born after the revolution had absolutely no connection with the colonial era. They would be the inheritors of the revolution. And um, so this is what I set out to do. I made it clear that I was going to deal with someone who had done something in public started a business, initiated a newspaper, formed an organization, ran for office, uh, wrote, or and maybe the only thing they wrote was an autobiography. I, in, I included anyone I could find any information on. So there are blacks and whites and women and men, though predominantly it's white men that are covered because they were the ones whose records were, were they were the ones who were taking the largest part in the public life. 
And I, I, as I've described to people, my, um, my research technique was like a vacuum cleaner. I just sucked up everything that I could find. And I spent a lot of time in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress reading books from the period, particularly autobiographies. Trying to set my own mind into what that must have been like to be a kid uh, whose parents had fought in the revolution, but uh, I had no concept of it, or, or no concept of living under British rule. Right. No, having, not having the experience is so different what you inherit as a tradition as opposed to what you experience. I think you mentioned this earlier, and uh, I mean, I grew up in, during the Depression and the Second World War. Now, those were just searing experiences, and they shaped the way I thought about my country, the world, poverty, my life, but someone born after that uh, has a very different experience, but then it still resonates, so they hear stories all the time. Yes, for me, World War II resonates because my father was, was right. there, and it's the same thing, but at the same point in time, it's not something that is, is really a part of my life. How did those ki young people coming uh, in the next generation after the revolution, first of all, deal with politics? Politics is interesting uh, because, largely because of Thomas Jefferson, there was a political opposition in the fourth year of the new government under the Constitution, and it wasn't one of structured politics. It was a fight over how best to interpret the revolution. Uh, what did the American Revolution mean? And this was a very angry period, uh, and it persists for about 20 years. Um, I'll give you an example in one of these autobiographies. Um, well, Joseph Story, who was a distinguished Supreme Court Justice, mm -hmm. describes uh, falling in love with a girl from a Federalist family, and he was a Jeffersonian, and they wouldn't allow uh, her to marry him. I mean, it was really deep feelings, a division. So politics is rather unusual. It's, we talk about our own age being partisan, which it is, but there, it, there wasn't so, many, so much the sort of dirty tricks kind of politics. It was just more real sense of, of suspicion and fear of the other side. So and this, this, so this country that we, get, we had always get a feeling was coming together was really not coming together in some ways? I, you know, it was coming together because politics became increasingly less important in American people's lives. Once the revolution had been fought, the Constitution secured, the presidency passing from one part, one group to another group, which happened in 1800 with Jefferson, uh, it's, it's, it's less important. You asked me about politics, and it was mm -hmm. divisive. One man refers to the fact that he couldn't move to a certain town because there wasn't enough business for, for two practices. And you had to have two practices, to have the Federalists in town and the Jeffersonians in town. Uh, but politics itself, what was really wonderful for this generation, and particularly for the young people, was the opening up of new careers, the possibility of early autonomy. In yeah. their lives. In your life, but, yes. And what, what did they do? Oh, they did a lot of things. One of the interesting things is, is this period, and we're talking about post-1776, is a period of, of great economic development and expansion. Not uniformly, really after 89, but by the time these people are, are uh, adolescents. And um, this increase in commerce put an emphasis upon literacy. So one of these things, one of these occupations, was the young men and women became school teachers. Didn't pay very well, but it paid enough for them to leave the farm, and it opened up a larger world to them. And very rarely did people continue teaching school for more than three, four, five years. Then they'd go into retailing. Uh, we don't realize that retailing is a, is, a new, is a new occupation. Before that, other than in the major cities, uh, people, people made clocks. They put those clocks on their backs, and they went out and sold them themselves. And uh, the same way with leather goods. So there was retailing, peddling. In the New England, northern states, peddling was a wonderful opportunity for young men. They would put on their back a bunch of, you know, pans, needles, hammers, tools, cloth, things that were manufactured in the north, and they would go south and peddle them. And they'd often pick up scrap metal on their way back and sell them to manufacturers or turning out brass buttons and the like. So peddling was, uh, was another way. Law, there was a great expansion in law, a great expansion in the professions in general. A uh, lot of new universities, um, politics was, all these little towns had mm -hmm. their, their political leaders. Newspapers, just exponential growth in the number of newspapers in America. So what was happening inside these young people? What were they developing that their parents would never have 
been able to, uh, to understand? Well, I think they were developing initiative. I think the older society, some people took the initiative, but by and large, stability was a very strong goal. And these young people didn't care that much about stability. They took it for granted. And so they were taking the initiative. Now, again, I have to remind you that I only looked at those people who were, you might say, out there moving and shaking the world. Right. At least 50, 60 percent of the population replicated what their parents had done. They stayed on the farm. Um, so I think initiative was new. I think early autonomy was new. Uh, I think there was an increase in marriages for love. I have a whole chapter on um, emotions and intimate relations because not I hadn't anticipated having it, but I, I ran into so much that was talked about intimate relations. And it hadn't been done before? Everything was arranged? or No, no. no. I, things weren't arranged, but they were quasi-arranged. People, if you stay in put, and in, in, in most of the towns we're talking about are 900, 1200, 1400, you kind of know who the people are in a cohort. And so it's not arranged, but it's contained. Uh, you, uh, besides the individualism, you also talk about the, pe that the fact that the people were mobile. You mentioned that mm -hmm. the northerners would go down mm -hmm. and, and peddle in the mm -hmm. south. What was the south doing? Were they doing the, the same thing? Mm, they, the South was exploding from an agricultural point of view. This is a cotton boom, so the Southerners are moving into Alabama and Mississippi and filling out Georgia, which was quite undeveloped at the time of the Revolution, and South Carolina, too. Uh, the invention of the cotton gin enabled people to grow cotton everywhere in the South, which they hadn't been able to before uh, because they were growing short staple cotton. So it was a dynamic period, but it was a period of the entrenchment of slavery. There had been a period in which it looked like perhaps slavery was not going to be profitable uh, because slavery previously had been devoted to growing rice and tobacco, but cotton saved slavery. So the South was a great deal more conservative. It conserved its traditions. It conserved patriarchal authority. That's what the North loses. The patriarchs lose in the North. Their sons get freedom, even their daughters. Uh, it's interesting, young men thought they owed their fathers their labor until they were 21 and they often sent back money home until they were 21. So the, the, this is a very important uh, divide in northern and southern states leading to finally a northern society and a southern society uh, was the more mobility and, and initiative and communication. What was the impact both in, in the south and the north on the family? the institution of I the family. I think the impact in the North was to put a great deal more pressure on the nuclear family, on just the family of husband, wife, and children, because they were so important. Because the North's moving agriculturally, too. It's moving into the Northwest and moving into Ohio. And, um, so there was that. And, um, and I think there was still more of a, um, a patriarchal family in the South where grandparents would have been more involved in their children's life. Both it, it, the family was very important in both societies because the, there's still a tremendous amount of work that's done in the family household. So there is a, there is this sense of it's mutual dependence, but there is also the sense that young people in the North get out earlier and form their families in, independently. What about religion? Well, this is a time of the, what's called the Second Great Awakening, a series of religious revivals. The the uh, nation-building period, the revolutionary period, <clears throat> people uh, belonged to churches, though relatively few. Um, by, by that I mean there, there, there was a lot of movement and the churches didn't follow in the West. Um, but in the beginning in, in 1798 there are a series of revivals and these revivals hit just about every Protestant denomination and they emphasize a personal religion personal conversion, and there's an emphasis more, uh, more on personal sin, uh, controlling habits, uh, but also this emotional uh, uh, coming to Christ. And these, re these um, revivals change the tone of public life in America. Certainly not everybody becomes an evangelical Christian, but the evangelical Christians pretty much dominate the public life. It's remarkable in the South because the South had been kind of a, if we think of um, sort of this dashing Southern planter who has cocks that he, uh, you know, has cockfights with, he's a wonderful horseman and, and uh, a great dancer when the fiddlers are out. Mm, this evangelical movement stops all that.
It's very hard on drinking and frivolity in general. The South really becomes quite sober in the sense of, of, of leaving that frolic past. Frolic past. Are, are there any comparisons that could be made with the impact of reli religion on politics today? I think there are. I think once there were the, the evangelical uh, movement was successful, then there was a move uh, to go into politics. One of the big things was Sabbatarianism, to get everything to stop on Sundays. And in the early decades of the 19th century, the mail was delivered on Sundays. It was delivered usually to the post office, because these are rural communities. And, and men would love to hang around the post office and, you know, to the fat why the wife and the children went to church or whatever, and the Sabbatarians wanted to stop the delivery mail. They were very unhappy that the Erie Canal <laughs> ran all the time because, of course, the rivers run all the time, so there were barges coming down the Erie Canal on Sunday, and this was bothering them. So uh, Sabbatarianism was one. It's the beginning of the temperance movement, the te and the temperance movement is very much a part of, of Christian revivals. The temperance movement is fascinating because it cut the consumption of alcohol in half. Probably the most liquor was consumed in the Revolutionary Era in, in American history. Really? Mm hmm It's a hard drinking society. There were no medicines. Liquor was often a medicine. Uh, wars always tend to produce more drinking. Drinking is men leading a separate bachelor's life drink. Yeah, and it was, it was very interesting. It also has to do with the fact that the work day is becoming more complicated, and, and particularly with there's some manufacturing, you know, working and drinking is when you have machines is not a good idea and but before that in every shop the youngest member would go out at 11 and 3 and bring back liquor for the men working in the shop and so the temperance movement was it, it took a long time it dominates all through the 19th century and historians had kind of treated it with your you know kind of as a as a joke but if we think of our concern about drugs today I think we have to see that's exactly how they felt about liquor then. We have a lot more to talk about in that era, but first I want to invite our viewers. Hello, this is uh, In Depth, and welcome to this month's series. Our guest is Joyce Appleby, and she's going to be with us for uh, three hours to take your phone calls and your questions about history, specifically her interest and her expertise in the Revolutionary period, but also uh, English and French history, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. And in what, what types of peri period there? The same period? Oh, yes, always. 17th to 18th and very early 19th. Our phone lines are open if you'd like to join us. If you live in the East or Central Time Zone, 202-737-0001. If you live in the Mountain or Pacific Time Zone, 202-737-0002. We also have an email address if you do, do not or cannot get in uh, by telephone. Here's the email address. It's booktv at cspan.org. And some people have already sent their emails in early that we've been able to um, to get in. So let's just dive into Thomas Jefferson because you spent okay. your whole life with him. I have spent a lot of it. And ha have you changed your thoughts on him at all? Yes. Yes, I've changed my thoughts on him. I think one of the things that happened in American history writing in general from 1960 on was a much more serious engagement with the history of slavery. Uh, and, and social historians began to study slaves themselves, not some abstraction slavery, but what the working conditions were, what they were like, what the origins were. And this uh, inevitably led back to the slaveholding founders. And this became a, a clear a case of what seemed like an apparent contradiction, it, it, this fighting for freedom and yet being slaveholders. When you think about it, you know, John Marshall, the Chief Justice, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, these are all slaveholders and yet they're prominent figures in the American Revolution. This viewer is interested in knowing, uh, reviewing the, what would like for you to review for us the terms or manner in which Thomas Jefferson considered his own spiritual affinities and religious perspectives at various times during his life. It's a very interesting question. Um, I can't say that I can follow changes in Jefferson's spirituality. Jefferson was a very serious person. He was interested in philosophy. He was a member of his local Anglican church, which became an Episcopal church. When he retired, he went to church every Sunday, walked down the hill of Monticello with his Book of Common Prayer under his arm. He 
did not like organized religion. He was very suspicious of churches. He was always nagging John Adams, to whom he wrote in the last years of his life, about priestcraft, which is what the dominance of ministers. He, he saw this as a form of, of tyranny. But he was a great admirer of Jesus. He admired Jesus so much that he decided that he was going to produce a gospel because he thought he could tell the difference between the real words of Jesus and those of the people who put together the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so he actually had two New Testaments and he clipped out what he thought. He said they stood out like diamonds in a dunghill and he put together his own Gospel. And he did this while he was president. Uh, so it shows that he was very much engaged with this issue of, of moral precepts. Spirituality, I I'm not so sure about in the way I think that the, that the author of that email uh, meant it. He certainly was um, very responsive to beauty, natural beauty, uh, natural beauty of, of Virginia, and, and uh, the beauty of music, the beauty of literature. Um, you write in one of your books that uh, when Jefferson returned to Monticello after his presidency, the major thing, change that he noticed in that area was religion. Oh, absolutely. Well, of course, I'm telling you about the, you know, the evangelical mm -hmm. uh, uh, revivals. That was the period, right? right? That was the period. And, and it had quite an impact on Southerners. I mean, in, in upper state New York, they called it the burned over district because the revivals were compared to, to fire and the fire had burned over. There's so many different revivals. Because the other thing, uh, blending religion and initiative, is this is when people usually men, had an insight about the church that led them to break away from their church and start a new church. So there were 10 or 15 new churches in America at this time. Uh, this, is the, this is the beginning of American denominationalism. And uh, there were you know, people who had attitudes about baptism, which had always been one, about Sabbatarianism, which Sabbath, which day to celebrate, or you know, just any doctrine. And uh, there was a tremendous amount of theological discussion going on, trying to get it right. We're going to start taking your calls, and the first call is from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Yeah, Virginia yeah. Beach, are you there? Every, are there. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. I'm a direct descendant of uh, the Blood family, and they first came to Olive White with a... Uh, King, jo King uh, Charles II with a land grant and then moved into North Carolina and William Blunt was a signer of the Constitution. I was wondering what she knows about the Blunt family, Ms. Appleby. I'm sorry, I don't know anything in particular about the Blunt family. I certainly know the name uh, because I'm familiar with the names of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Tucson, Arizona. Hi there. Um, Hi. It's uh, it's wonderful that you have uh, Miss Appleby on. You remind me of the people that I uh, studied under and learned history from, and uh, it's a delight to see that uh, that type of tradition in uh, in historiography is still alive, so uh, and thriving. I was curious. My area is, uh, was uh, intellectual history, and I was curious what your thoughts were, having studied both uh, England and France, the continent, and the revolutionary period what your findings were about the influence of the American Revolution and the ideas of it on the French Revolution and vice versa. Um, I, I found the case kind of slight on both sides, uh, really, but I was wondering if you had any insights on that subject. Yes, I think there was quite an interaction uh, between the two revolutions. I think um, that for the French, the French kind of cannibalize uh, the American Revolution. By that I mean they're not influenced in the sense that they have ideas they didn't have before. What they see is that this is a real example of a, of a people changing their government and not only that but announcing totally new principles for founding a new nation. Now that view was embraced by those people who were the most radical in the debates before the French Revolution when you're uh, having the calling of the first election of the Estates General that becomes the National Assembly. And, uh, but the conservatives who look to England for a, a better model for France, they also pick up on the American experience, political experience. One of the key issues is whether you have a one-house legislature or a two-house legislature, the second house being reserved for the nobility or the aristocracy. Um, and America was a real material for these debates. So in that sense, the American Revolution 
influenced. I think it, it gave credibility to the reformers. It wasn't overwhelming influence in the sense of giving them ideas they hadn't had before, but it strengthened one strain of ideas. And then what's fascinating is the French Revolution comes bouncing back to America because it, it, it really attracts attention in America when they execute the king. There, so it's four years after the beginning of the revolution in 89, in, the, in January of 93. That's kind of, wow, the greatest monarchy in the world, at least in terms of, of an army, France, has beheaded its king and announced that it's a republic. We're living in an era of republics. First there's the American Republic, now there's the French Republic. And I think that that was tremendously important in energizing people to join Jefferson in opposing the Federalists because the Federalists were seen as very pro-British, as trying to turn the United States into a kind of a pure model of British society. Washington, D.C. Hi. Good day, Ms. Appleby. The subject I'd like to bring up is, uh, it's not lost history, but it's kind of like uh, the things we don't speak of. For instance, John Adams mentions this in his writings. There's a terrible price to pay for what we're doing to the First Nations or 500 nations that were here before the Europeans arrived. He mentions it, but it seems to be kind of lost, and it's repeated now when the government of Canada and the Episcopalian Church says for 150 years the Episcopalian Church raped, murdered, and tortured children. Everyone's admitted to it as public knowledge, but really Americans don't know about this. I'd also like to mention George Walker Bush is going to jail for war crimes. I think the John Adams that you're talking about, I believe that's John Quincy Adams, uh, John Adams' son, who is so concerned about American treatment of Native Americans. But one of the sad things is that John, uh, John Quincy Adams came to that in his mature years. In his earlier years, he'd been very supportive of Andrew Jackson, who was sort of the, uh, you know, the, the iconic uh, Indian fighter. You may be right about it's not being known, but the last 30 years there's been a tremendous amount of scholarship on Native Americans and the uh, battle between um, the expansive new United States and the Indians who are trying to keep their ancestral lands. And of course that is a series of battles that goes on throughout the 19th century. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there's been a, a really popular history, but there's just hundreds of books that deal with the many, many, many tribes and their experiences. So I think if you're interested in the subject, you can easily find the works uh, in the library because young people, young graduate students, are very fascinated with this subject. Where did you teach over the years? I taught at the San Diego State University my first 14 years, and then the University of, of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, the last 20 years. And is there a reason why you stayed at UCLA? Maybe there's a reason why you didn't. <laughs> what is it about UCLA that would keep oh, you there oh, 20 I'm, years I'm a teaching? Californian. I, I moved to California when I was 14, and I've lived abroad several years, and I've lived in, in New York, uh, but I really am a Californian. I, I, I love, I'm a gardener. I love being, uh, having a 365-day growing season. I, I, I love the freedom, I guess, I associate with a benign climate. And I love Los Angeles. It's a vibrant, exciting city, so I wasn't really tempted to leave Los Angeles. The next call is from Los Angeles. Go ahead, caller. Hello, um, Professor Appleby. I wanted to talk to you about the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books a few years back in 2003, and then also bring up a question about the John Mersheimer, Stephen Walt paper on the pro-Israel lobby, and how Thomas Jefferson and George Washington would view that now. You know, caller, um, uh, we also have our 30-day policy for in-depth, and you have been on very recently, so we're just going to go on to Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Uniontown. Uh, thank you for taking my call, and thank you for your scholarship. Um, my family is all Quaker, and they first, a grandpa first actually came in 1679, and we're very fortunate that the Quakers kept meticulous records and have saved them over the years. They kept personal journals, deeds, bills of sale, etc. Uh, recently, I was able to spend almost an entire week in the Quaker Library at Swarthmore College reviewing, actually, they have hundreds of thousands of rolls of microfiche of these records. 
and there are several centers like that in the country. Are there other groups that came to this country so early that have kept records like that that are accessible to the public? Well, there's, uh, of course, the Library of Congress, which does have manuscripts and records. New Englanders are wonderful, wonderful record keepers, and that would include the Congregational Church, Presbyterian Church, the Unitarians, uh, who would, have at the, would be at the end of the 18th century, but their forebears would have come with the original Puritans. Um, and then the Methodists and the Baptists became the major churches after the evangelical revivals that I talked about, and they have certainly kept their records. Almost every church that I can think of has a, maybe not everyone, but most of them have universities, and universities are centers of those archives. Yes, I think we've done a, a very good job of keeping those records. Andover, Massachusetts. Oh, good afternoon. No, it's North Andover. Sorry. There's a big difference. Yes, there is. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, this is the original Andover from the 1600s, and the previous caller was perfect, Professor, for my question. Uh, you mentioned Laurel Thatcher Ulrich at the beginning of the discussion, and she wrote a wonderful book in the 80s called Good Wives, which discusses one person, Anne Dudley Bradstreet, who lived her last 30 years of her life here in North Andover, and was supposedly, uh, from many people's view, our first published poet ever from America. Her poem was published in 1650 back in England. And I wonder, do you have any feelings about her? Do you know much about her work um, and her life in the New World? And there is a wonderful book from Charlotte Gordon, real quick. Uh, it's called Mistress Bradstreet. Charlotte Gordon just had it published last year, and that's a very good uh, piece uh, describing her life. Thank you. Well, like all people my age, I certainly read uh, Bradstreet's poetry when I was in school. But I, I don't, I'm sure you know a great deal more about her life than I do. But she certainly is an important literary figure. I want to go back to um, what you said earlier, that pe people would look at you politically differently. Let's talk about, you said the conservative. some people would think you were conservative because of your background in, ca in uh, capitalism. Why would people say you're liberal? Oh, I think they say I was liberal because uh, when I'm not teaching history, or when I wasn't teaching history, I was often active in politics. I care a lot about uh, a number of political issues. And when I have had the time, um, I, have, I have worked on either political campaigns or on campaigns behind policies. This emailer says, from your understanding of our Constitution, would you say that this administration has violated it? Yes. How? Well, I think the Hamden v. Rumsfeld decision, which uh, expresses it very well, um, four years this September 17th, which is Constitutional Day, in 2002, I was, uh, along with Ellen Du Bois, uh, uh, a pair that collected signatures for a petition of historians. We were petitioning uh, Congress to assert itself and to resume its constitutional powers to be the body that declares war. Um, do you think you have time for me to read that resolution? Sure, if you have okay, it. Okay, yes, it's here, it's short. So there, there were, you and another historian. It circulated petitions. Mm -hmm. it was, this was going on in the summer of 2002, and I don't know if you look back, that was when there was a lot of talk about an attack on Iraq mm -hmm. without any sure knowledge. Um, uh, Gonzalez, who was then the counselor for the, in the White House, was saying that the president didn't have to go to Congress. Uh, other people were saying he didn't have to go to the UN. He was, he wasn't, he was. Finally, he said that he was going to do both of those things. But uh, it was a time of maximum confusion about what were we talking about, what were we thinking about. And so we uh, had the idea of, of circulating a petition. We did it through email, and within about three days, we had 1,200 American historians sign it. And then we presented the petition to a group of uh, congressmen led by Congressman Bob Filner uh, at the, outside the Cannon uh, uh, House office building. And uh, this is what the resolution said. And as I say, in the light of the Hamden v. Rumsfeld decision, it's, it's kind of interesting. We, the undersigned American historians, urge our members of Congress to assume their constitutional responsibility to debate and vote on whether or not to declare war in Iraq. We do so because Americans deserve to hear their representatives deliberate about a possible war. Lest such a momentous course of action be undertaken by the president alone after a public I airing filled with rumors, leaks, and speculations. 
We ask our senators and representatives to do this because Congress has not asserted its authority to declare war for over a half a century, leaving the president solely in control of war powers to the detriment of our democracy and in clear violation of the Constitution. We believe it is particularly urgent that Congress reassert its authority at this time, since an attack on Iraq, if made, would be an American initiative. Since there was no discussion of Iraq during the 2000 presidential campaign, the election of George Bush cannot be claimed as a mandate for an attack. Only a date by America's elected representatives can engage the public in a serious consideration of the costs, risks, and wisdom of such a war. Why should historians sign that? Or why did you tell us? Why did you think that historians should because sign? Because we're the keeper of of uh, memory. We're the preservers of uh, the original intent, as it were, of our institutions. We know about these traditions in a way that it's hard for other people to do because we spend our lives thinking about the past and really relating the past to the present. Because there's a part of the past we always drag along with us, and then there's a part that gets left out. And um, I remember that an NPR uh, reporter called me up very angrily after this petition. He said, how is it that I didn't know that Congress is supposed to declare war? <laughs> I said, well, it's probably because you, like most of the people in America, were born after 1941, which is the last time an American president went to Congress and asked for a declaration of war. December 8th, the day after the Pearl Harbor attack, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt did. But it was sort of interesting, this angry response that he didn't know that it was Congress that was to declare war. And where is that in the Constitution? Well, you'd have to give me the Constitution. Yeah, I got a copy right here. All right, let's see if I can find it. I think it probably should be under. Well, it should be the powers of Congress. <laughs> Here. I'll tell you what, while you look for that, I also want to read to you um, a critic of what you and the... Uh, you found it? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's on uh, Article 1, Section 8, and, um, and that's where we list the, mm -hmm. the powers of promise. To declare war, grant le letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. To raise and support armies. After your, uh, your group took the, the petition to Congress, David Horowitz, uh, had some criticism for you, and I just want to read it and get so okay. that you give you a chance right. to respond to it. He said, You were a bunch of leftists who, on other days of the week, regard the Constitution as a reactionary obstacle to their redistributionist agendas, and who even admit that their real agendas with this petition on Iraq is to stop the war, not to preserve the document, have decided to launch yet another foray into the public square under the transparently false banner of loyalty to the strictures of dead white male slaveholders. And then he said, did I get that right? Well, I don't think of the founding fathers as dead white slaveholders. They obviously were slaveholders among them. I don't think that that's um, a, a just criticism of me. I don't know the other, you know, 1,100 and some signers, but I have a great respect for the Constitution. I don't have respect for original intent in the way in which the, uh, there's an idea that you could have a jurisprudence that would be based upon what the Founding Fathers intended, because the Founding Fathers often compromised, and so it's very hard to get back to the intention. But I have a great respect for the jurisprudential traditions uh, that have flown from interpreting the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution is, a, is, a, um, is ballast for our democratic nation, which is a very vibrant but also a very contentious society. You know, that, the, that term original intent, we've heard a lot uh, recently, but over the years in which Clarence, specifically Clarence Thomas and, and Antonin Scalia, I mm -hmm. think I remember the most, who have, who have used this mm -hmm. uh, original intent, original intent, original intent. It, you don't think, it's, you don't think it's, it works? Or that it's not what, what I don't think do it, it works without interpretation and without a, some understanding of um, the development of American society and the way in which the Supreme Court has interacted with those developments at key points along the way to interpret it. Um, you know, I, I think there's an absolutely irreducible quality of interpretation when you go from a founding doctrine. Uh, 
and apply that to living generations passing on the others. But it doesn't mean that you're not concerned with what the Constitution says. It's just that it isn't an easy way to decide a case because there aren't that many. It's a very short Constitution we have. Let's get back to the phone calls. Buffalo, New York. Go ahead. I would like to ask Dr. Appleby if she would comment on the beginnings of Mormonism in New England. Thank you. Well, Mormonism comes out of the burned over district that I mentioned. That is to say, it comes out of uh, Joseph Smith lived in western New York. Um, I think that there was a lot of syncretism in, the, in Mormonism. In other words, I think that there, there were the influences of this really rich religious period in American life can be found embedded in Mormonism. I don't really, I'm not an expert on the origins of, of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, so I, I really can't say much more than that. But it seems, uh, you know, it seems very understandable w within the developments of the period. Lakefield, Minnesota. Uh, I'd, I'd like to have a chance to uh, make two comments and ask her a question. Go ahead. Uh, many years ago when my children were in school, I ran across a box of books that I bought at auction that were a set of Encyclopedia Britannica that was written in the late 1800s. And when I got around to reading a little of them, I found that it was very different history in that set of encyclopedia than what I'd been taught in school, which made sent me off to read a lot of history since then. And one of my favorite books, and I would like to have a chance to comment to you, Connie, in a minute if you would, uh, one of my favorite books is James Lowen, a uh, professor of history of Vermont, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, wrote Lies My Teacher Told Me. And I'm part Cherokee, and I ne never knew a whole lot about my history uh, until uh, part partly because of that book. Uh, but Connie, I also would like to make this comment. You have Mr. Horowitz on your program quite often, and many years ago in the Des Moines Register when I lived in Iowa, uh, there was a large article that was written by a man who said he had been uh, an FBI informant with Horowitz at the same time, worked with him, and that instead of being an, a liberal that turned conservative, Mr. Horowitz had been uh, a mole inside the, the Democratic Party and uh, the, um, uh, went out to uh, um, uh, peace demonstrations and uh, Democrat demonstrations and uh, that was his real background. He'd always worked for the FBI as more right-wing. So I'd, I'd just like to make that statement and ask, ask uh, your guest uh, about Mr. Lowen's book and what she thinks about the old Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, I think it's disconcerting uh, to people who want to see history as fixed and known for all times to realize that different generations do interpret the past differently. But if you think about it, it's almost inevitable because when we or go back to the past, we're very much influenced by the present and we want to explain how the present came about. I, I sometimes use the analogy of, of writing a history of a marriage. Uh, if you write a history of the marriage, say after 20 years and it's been an extraordinarily happy marriage or a very satisfying one, then you tell a different story than if you wrote it after 30 years when perhaps there'd been a divorce. You're always trying to explain the last thing. We're going to write our histories differently uh, because of 9-11. That doesn't mean dramatically differently. It just means we're going to be looking for different things in the past. We're going to bring them in and then uh, mix them in with, with, with what has been the conventional um, story up till then. There really isn't any way to change this because the past is not dead. It's a very living thing to the living. It's a resource of, for understanding about why we think a certain way or why certain developments took place. So the fact that you have uh, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, which taught you, was written in the late um, 19th century and you went to school in the middle of 20th or late 20th century, there is going to be a dramatically different uh, story. Just think about it. America was still pretty isolated at the end of the 19th century. It had not emerged on the world scene. It had not become the, the, you know, the most powerful nation in the world. All of those developments are going to have to be in your mind when you go back and, and write a history of the United States. What year did you graduate from college? Fifty. 
So it, have you seen a change? Just oh. in, in the in the oh, 56 oh, years oh, of oh, dramatic is there change. something about do you remember anything about what oh, in the history? biggest the biggest change is the one I alluded to earlier uh, in the expansion of higher education and the and the writing of history in the 1960s 70s and 80s when social history was developed I mean we really didn't know anything about the lives of ordinary people not only that the historian's view was that history is what is significant. And that's true. It is about, it's not everything that happens, it's what's significant. But the people who wanted to study um, women or wanted to study immigrants showed how their experience was significant. Uh, it, so that it's, it's, an, it, it's no longer a sense that they have to be the movers and shakers. There is a sense that all these developments, all the way in which lives are structured and lived and experienced and reflected upon, are, it's vital to understand this in order to write. A, a complex but comprehensive history of the nation. If you've just joined us, we are spending three hours this afternoon with Joyce Appleby taking questions ac from across the country and also emails if you'd like to contact us that way. Next call is from San Diego. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I just wanted to make a comment about the uh, original, original intent that you were discussing a few minutes ago. Um, I, I think that uh, um, it's almost impossible to, to use that a hundred percent purely when, when the world is so different today than it was when the, the founding fathers lived. Um, I, I think the Second Amendment is a perfect example of it. Uh, in, in the time of the founding fathers, uh, it took minutes between firing the first shot from a gun and firing the second shot from a gun. They were, they were, they were muzzle-loaded, and, and it was a whole big sophisticated process. Today, we can fire off in the same amount of time a hundred rounds of ammunition. So to, to, to try to compare uh, the, the intent of the, the Founding Fathers relative to original intent um, is, is virtually impossible. Uh, at that time, the vast majority of the people lived in the wilderness. Today, that's not the case. And very few people live in the wilderness where they need guns to protect themselves from wild animals and things like that. So the, the, the whole world is a different place. Uh, so how could they even attempt to use purely, as, as Antonin Scalia would, would, would say, purely use the original intent of the Constitution and not interpret it in today's time? Well, I think you, you have to realize that we have an amendment process. Now, I think it is an unduly uh, restricted amendment process, but we can pass amendments uh, to bring the Constitution up to date. I. I, ag I agree with you that, that this subsequent living is going to influence how we see that Constitution, but I don't think I agree with you that, that in original intent isn't important in trying to determine cases, but it's, it's an original intent that's trying to look at the broadest picture. You take the Second Amendment, now that, of course, is a controversy over the Second Amendment, but it seems to apply, at least it does to me, to militias. So it applies to, as it were, extensions of government authority. It's very hard to read that Second Amendment and, and see it as uh, the, uh, providing a case for having unlimited access to guns with no regulation. Uh, so I. I think what I would emphasize is that if we really want to change the Constitution, we have the amendment process. But as long as we have the Constitution, we have to be very concerned with what the goals were in it. But in our interpreting those goals, we're going to be influenced by the nine generations, eight, nine generations since its ratification. Did I understand you to say that you think the uh, amendment process is too restrictive? Oh, yes. Why? Because it, it just look at it, 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 it takes three quarters, uh, one quarter plus one of the states can block any amendment. And we have a very uh, skewed distribution of population. So uh, what, what would that be, 13 states? We could have 13 states that represented less than a tenth of the population be able to block what 90% of the people wanted to do in terms of amending the Constitution. Uh, those small states are almost all of them, not all, but almost all of them are in the plains, the western plains. Uh, so it just, that seems to me to be very restrictive to allow Wyoming, Idaho, North and South Dakota, like, to block what uh, the rest of the country wants to do. It was particularly notable um, in getting legislation for cities 50, 60 years ago. Do you think if, if it was less restrictive, that there would be too many amendments passing? Probably. 
But, you know, we, we passed one amendment and then we unpassed it, as it were, with a prohibition, so that's possible. Yes, uh, you know, I think that's true. There would be more. Fort Lauderdale, hello. Uh, two quick questions. Um, regarding uh, the Founding Fathers, there seems in the public uh, uh, books to be uh, a divide, an Adams camp versus a Franklin camp. Do you see that emerging? And uh, do you think one has to choose one or the other? And uh, concerning History News Service, what is that? If I read the television right, your director and, and uh, the Horowitz column came from that. So those are my questions. No, I'll answer that. The Horowitz column certainly didn't come from the History News Service. But let me uh, uh, go to your first question, because I think it's fascinating the way in which the public takes sides, or, or a, a part of the reading public that uh, reads books about the Founding Fathers takes sides. I don't think it's necessary at all. I'm inordinately uh, admiring of Alexander Hamilton, as well as Thomas Jefferson, of John Marshall, of John Adams. But I guess because their lives, what was critical in their lives were these political divides. And if you fall in love with one of them, then you, then you have to, you know, dislike his rivals uh, or his opponents. But it, it's certainly not necessary, but it's very funny. And, and I, because I do write about Jefferson and have done more research on him, I frequently speak in the public about him. And Jefferson is a very popular president, but wow, when that biography of John Adams was read by millions of people, um, the, I, the audience would sometimes be sort of hostile to me. And I was thinking, what, what's going on here? And then I, then I figured it out. They didn't feel they could love Adams without not loving Jefferson quite as much. Do you love Jefferson, by the way? Do I love Jefferson? Mm -hmm. as much I as admire time. him. I admire him a lot. The question about the History News yes. Service. What well, is it? The History News Service is an informal um, association of historians who write op-ed pieces for newspapers that take an issue and put it in historical perspective. There are very few issues or policy decisions or controversies that come before us that don't have a history. And the history often can um, influence your feeling about it or reduce the tension. If you think this isn't the first time the country's faced this, you think, oh, phew, we've done that before. I mean, immigration's a beautiful example. Mm -hmm. We've been there before. We survived. Uh, what it, Jim Banner is my, uh, who's uh, independent historian in Washington, D.C., is the co-director with me. Um, we invite historians to submit op-ed pieces, which they do. A lot of historians don't know how to write for newspapers. Both of us have worked for newspapers. And so we go through an editing process where we suggest edits to the authors. And it goes back and forth, and sometimes three or four revisions. And then we send it off to several hundred newspapers that have agreed to look at our op-eds. And I would, we distribute about one a week. And probably no more than eight or nine newspapers pick them up. Uh, but but they are uh, they are published and it's it's wonderful. I, I mean to us to us it's you know building and maintaining a bridge between the public and historians and I think they have lots to 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 share. So that's what it is. I don't know where the idea of Horowitz is coming from the History News Service. I think I think what it was is that the, his response came once yours was um, once Possibly. you once you made that he we a lot of people respond. Rob, we never had a story about the History News Service, mm -hmm. through the History News Service. The LA Times did an op-ed that we wrote independently, but it wasn't through the mm -hmm. History News Service. I think what the person perhaps is doing is confusing the History News Service with the History News Network, which is a website, mm -hmm. which I'm uh, a member of the board of. And, and this is a, a website for historians and bloggers. It's about History News. But the History News Service is really for newspapers, but we run our operation through email. And do you have a website for the History News Service? Mm -hmm, we do. And what can people find there? Oh, I don't think I have it with me. Oh, uh, no, we have it. We have oh, an address. You? Mm -hmm. Oh, you do? Sure, I... it's up on the screen right now. So, Oh, good. Yeah. So oh, what, what can people find there? They can find every single op-ed we've ever distributed. We have all of our op-eds archived on it. They'll have a, find a description of how we operate. They'll discover that no money is ever exchanged. If an author does get money, which the bigger newspapers tend to pay, it goes directly to them. It explains that once we have distributed a piece, anyone can use it any way they want. They can use it in the classroom. They can print it out. And it, and it also... Um, has a list of the newspapers, I believe, and has 
pictures with photos of the authors. How do you decide which historians get in and which ones don't? Oh, we, we take all, all of them, all that can be whipped into shape, as it were, all of them that can be turned into good op-eds, we distribute. We don't, we don't filter at all. Next is uh, Reno, Nevada. Hi. Um, I have a couple questions for you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I read um, American Spinks' uh, book on Thomas Jefferson, and I remember uh, one of his quotes was saying that he felt that people that lived like 50 years in the future shouldn't be beholden to laws and doctrines set by people that have long passed away. So I wonder what you would think of Jefferson's um, you know, opinion would be of like the strict adherence to the Constitution, of like not being flexible and changing it. And also, um, what do you think of the constitutionality of, say, like the Federal Reserve and, and income tax? And that's my two questions. Thanks. Thanks. Well, the, in, the income tax has, a, has an amendment. There's no question of the constitutionality of the income tax. The Constitution permitted an income tax, but there's been so much controversy about it that they passed an amendment anyway. Uh, to make it and it's incorporated in the Constitution. Um, let's see, your other question was about Jefferson's belief that the world belongs in usufruct, a legal term meaning the use of, mm -hmm. uh, to the present generation. That was an interesting idea of Jefferson's. None of his friends agreed with him. He just fell in love with the idea and he wrote people about it. He thought that there ought to be a plebiscite every generation so that the laws we live under would be laws that we had all chosen, not laws passed when our grandfathers were alive or our great-grandmothers. Um, Madison, who's very much a, a, a beholden to Jefferson as a, a younger uh, person, and very, uh, had to try to soft-pedal this idea with Jefferson, and, and Adams didn't think it was a very good idea. I think it would probably be a, a little unduly chaotic to have each generation, but Jefferson was so in love with that idea that he uh, started out trying to figure out how long a generation is, which is not all that easy to do. I think he came up with 19 years, but I'm not positive it was 19. I had to work that with my uh, inheriting the revolution. How long a time was I going to take? And I took 24 years, 1776 to 1800. I took that cohort, people born then. Um, of course, if Jefferson had his way, the Constitution would be voted on every generation. Um, I, I, I think I'm for a little more ballast. The, um Raising of Taxes Amendment was the 16th Amendment, mm -hmm. and I was just looking at it here. It was ratified in uh, February 1913. Mm -hmm. You said that uh, that this amendment was, there was just so much controversy. Yeah, I know it's not your period, but there was just so much controversy, and so they decided to do an amendment anyway? Yeah, I'm sure I'll be corrected by some of it. That, <laughs> that is my understanding. The, in fact, the, the Constitution provided for taxations, but in fact, the federal government didn't tax. It was supported mainly for 100 years on uh, imposts, that is, they did tax trade coming into the United States and selling land. After all, they got this national domain, and they were expanding the national domain through conquest all during the 19th century. Uh, so they didn't need to... Uh, raise money through taxes. And that long period sort of indicated to some people that they didn't have the right to do it. Columbus, Ohio, hi. Hi, I'm a middle school teacher and I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Appleby your thoughts on the current state of history education at the secondary level and also what should be the relationship between <clears throat> secondary teachers and professional historians? Caller, before, before you leave us, give us your opinion of it. Uh, I think it's it's doing well. Um, there are some problems with a uh, no child left behind law, um, leaving out social studies. So some areas are spending more time on reading and math and less time on social studies. But in states that have resisted that efforts, um, I think the social studies still remain strong and vital. And do you find that your students are interested in history? Yeah, they are very much so, um, especially if it's taught in an interactive. Uh, manner. Dr. Appleby. Well, I think the relation between um, historians teaching in higher education and historians teaching in the uh, public schools should be as close as possible, and I have a feeling that, that it is getting closer. I mean, one of the things we have now is uh, Senator Byrd's initiative of teaching American history, and a lot of money is going to school districts all over the country, and some of that money is being spent on 
uh, conferences where uh, historians who write come in and talk with uh, historians whose principally uh, work is teaching, and that's all to the good, but I think they could get closer and closer. I don't know how uh, good the teaching is in the secondary schools. I know that every year when I was teaching, someone would come in and talk about Mrs. Brooks or Mr. Lyon or, or Mr. Hernandez and how they'd turn them on to history. So I know there's a lot of excellent teaching going on there. But I will tell you something that really troubles me, and I, there'll probably never be a change. But one summer, I was asked by a publisher to read the firm's fifth grade history texts, eighth grade history texts, and eleventh grade history texts. And they were all told exactly the same story. The only difference was the level of language, the vocabulary. And this seems to me just a terrible thing to do. I think that the, if I were czar of the history world, I would have uh, fifth graders learning about individuals in the past from all over the world because it's time when they can identify with, with heroes or uh, magical stories or uh, stories that are uh, romantic. And, and I would be interested in having eighth graders do local history. They could find all about their, the use of land in their area and the, and the old laws and then teach the story of American history and the development of the nation to 11th graders who by that time are about ready to vote and have a genuine interest in how these policies and, and procedures were developed. It'll never happen because these institutions are already firmly entrenched, but that did, I did think that was very sad. And, and you'd think that hearing the story over and over again, you'd really remember it, but I think the tendency is to just drop it out of your mind when you've had enough of it. And it's been told several times before. Sacramento, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have another uh, uh, original intent question, and, and that is, I don't understand why we even assess such great importance to the original intent. I mean, given the fact that, that the founding fathers intended, for example, all men created equal to mean only landowning white males. I mean, I think we would pretty much all agree that that, that view wasn't just dated. It was it was immoral. So I, I, I've never really understood, given that one example, why we even assess such importance to their original intent. Well, let me get just look at your example. Um, this is a time in which the landowning qualification is dropping away. So there is definitely, I think, a move at the time of the founding to have universal white male suffrage. The real outrage, of course, is the tolerance of slavery. But I think we should also remember, and this is not taught enough, that the United States was the first nation in which you had slavery abolished. In 1780, the state legislature of Pennsylvania abolished slavery. That was before the, even the anti-slave societies in Great Britain. And they showed that this was an institution that could be stopped. And it just took the discussion of slavery out of these lofty debates about slavery and put it right down the street where Pennsylvania said, if you come to Philadelphia, which was the capital of the United States in the 1790s, with your slaves, you must register them and they cannot stay here longer than six months or they'll be free. So the revolution did, did contain these ideals of equality and justice. Why have a constitution at all? I think a case could be made for a democracy in which the legislature could do whatever it wanted, but I think you ought to think about that for a while and think of the things that you don't want Congress to do now or you didn't want Congress to do in the 90s, and you'd see that there, there would be a lot of policy shifting that perhaps would not, you know, not be such a good idea. I think what the Constitution does is it affirms certain basic values and a certain distribution of power that does act as a, 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 as a good um, steadier for a democratic nation. And a democratic nation, I think because of, of the majority vote, needs that kind of steadier. I really wouldn't like to think of our government without the Bill of Rights, which is the first ten amendments to the Constitution, because I know I and many, many other people would probably invade people's rights if we could get away with it in certain instances. It just keeps us, it keeps us not honest, it keeps us just. Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, you discussed earlier about the, oh, by the way, I'm reading your Jefferson book right now. Mm. I'm enjoying it very much. Good. You mentioned earlier uh, about the Great Awakening during the 1800s. Was there any alliances, if you want to call it that, between the Great Awakening and any particular political party, philosophy, or whatever, similar to the evangelical right wing and the Republican Party today? Uh, not really. I mean, there was a very much of an alliance between the Federalists and the um, 
Anglican, Presbyterian, and Congregational churches in the North, in New England in particular. They were almost all Federalists, and, and, and you had people uh, preaching from the, the uh, uh, pulpit about the stability of the Washington administration. Uh, but the, the evangelical um, movement, the really, uh, it, for one, it covered so many people, and it was so powerful in the West. And the West tended to be more Jeffersonian uh, because Jefferson spoke to um, the ordinary men of society. So I wouldn't say that it cut, it cut one way or another. Um, there certainly were religious people and leaders who were involved in political campaigns, but it wasn't a clear divide. Las Vegas, go ahead. Las Vegas, you're on the air. Oh, thank you. I love your show. Uh, do you think if the issue came before the Supreme Court, they could imply that the Constitution does not automatically give citizenship to children born here if both parents are here illegally? Thank you. I'm not a constitutional authority, but I don't see how that could be done without a constitutional amendment. Let me ask you this email. You know, I should take that back. Hmm? Congress does, not, I should take that back, Congress did change naturalization laws, uh, but that, no, that's still constitutional. That, it's very interesting because the, the, the number of years that you have to be in this country has gone from 5 to 14 to 7 to 9, mm -hmm. so that is a statutory uh, purview of Congress. But I don't believe the definition of citizenship is. Uh, this emailer, Ron Alexander of Oakton, Virginia, asked, uh, what is your view of the importance of an economic analysis of the developments in U.S. history from the 17th to the early 19th century? What was at one time referred to as the political economy of the U.S.? In particular, do you see political economy in an international context reflected perhaps in trade and the regulation of trade? Well, I think uh, when you say an economic interpretation, I'm certainly for uh, an interpretation that includes economic developments because they have a tremendous impact. But I would, economic interpretation is often assumed to mean that you're looking for economics as being the predominant influence. And that I don't think is true. I think there are intellectual movements that are powerful, political ones, social ones, and economic ones. And the, and the real uh, challenge is to weigh and interweave uh, those different streams of development. There was a second part to that. Uh, um, no, I, I don't think so. It was about an economic interpretation. Oh. This is, um, uh, in particular, do you see the political economy in right. an international context? Oh. Yes, uh, I definitely. I mean, we live in, a, in an increasingly um, international world. You know, it was very much an international context in the 18th century. The, and the anomaly is the 19th century when economic developments, well, even there, the world world trade is very important. What made cotton king was the fact that the British were going through an industrial revolution which focused upon fabrics and which uh, southern cotton was the source of, their, of the, this raw material. So certainly the international context has always been important and even more so now. You said earlier that the whole issue of enterprise and capitalism had been something you focused on? Yes. Throughout. And why did you decide to do that? Why did I do that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I suppose there's an underlying proclivity that you never quite understand. I certainly didn't start out to. I really started out as a political uh, historian. I'll tell you why. I became, my first book is on economic thought in, in 17th century England. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, uh, my first job, I had to teach American history to first and second year students at San Diego State. And the textbook had already been chosen for us. We all taught the same course, and it was a course in which we discussed primary documents. And so we would start with Puritan sermons, um, and then we would sort of jump over time from the Puritans, getting the Puritans here, and the next big set of documents would be the Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations and the Federalist Papers and on into the 19th century. And I couldn't figure out why there was this dramatic change in the understanding of human nature. Puritan sermons treated human beings as being bathed in sin, helpless to do right without the intervention of the Lord, and they emphasized the wickedness and the, and the fickleness of human beings. Then when you leaped ahead 150 years to Adam Smith, you found out, mm, 
Mm -mm. Human beings were really basically pretty solid people. They were self-interested, but it was enlightened self-interest. They were rational. They figured out how to use their resources in a way that would maximize their return. And I thought, what happened? Because Smith doesn't argue this position on human nature. He just assumes it. He just tosses off these lines that give you the sense that the human being is a bargainer and a, a rational um, a market participant. And so I decided that I would look at, the, at a new, um, new set of documents in the 17th century. I should say that I was there because my husband, who got a PhD after I did, gave up a career in newspapering to become an historian as well, uh, was in England to do his doctoral research. The whole family had to go. So I had this year off after I'd started teaching three years. It was wonderful. And I decided to read everything that had been written about economics in England in the 17th century. And in the course of that examination, I discovered that the concept of human nature changed. And as in, in writings about trade, increasingly, everyone was seen as a merchant. Even the king is a merchant. And people follow their own interests. And they are alert to how they can organize their resources better. And I saw that there had been this dramatic change in the conception of human nature. But in order to put that into context, I had to do a lot of work on the actual economic developments in England and, of course, the economic developments in the colonies. And then I saw that this is extremely important. This change in the conception of human nature was extremely important to the um, acceptance of democratic theory, which also assumes that people are able to take care of themselves in a rational way. And the, the issue of a change in human nature, what was the change? The change from thinking of human beings as being utterly fickle and, mm -hmm. and sin prone and needing strong ah. institutions mm -hmm. to control them, keep them on the straight and narrow, mm -hmm. to this one in which they say, no, they have an internal mechanism that keeps them stable and makes them take care of their families and, and be responsible. And then you can think of democracy if you think of a world of internally uh, you know, uh, directed people. And mm -hmm. so that seemed to me a very important insight that actually economic developments were what made modern democracy possible. Richmond, Virginia, go ahead. Uh, yes, I've heard that many of the eastern woodland Indians died from European diseases. And I was wondering during what years this happened and what became of the ones who did not succumb to the diseases. Thank you. It, the impact on northern and southern American, uh, South American, North American natives uh, was incredible. The impact of European diseases. It's a, it's a horrible story. It's a, really a holocaust. It started uh, with the arrival of Columbus and it continued all the way through uh, 19th century Russians landing in the Aleutian Islands. It's a case of having a population that had no resistance to the germs, the microorganisms that the Europeans brought. The Europeans had mixed with Africans, they'd mixed with Asians, and they had over the years acquired immunity to a lot of diseases. The Indians in North and South America didn't have immunity to measles, pneumonia, smallpox, pleurisy, any of these diseases. And it just, it just wiped out the Carib Indians uh, in the early uh, 16th century. And as I say, it continued. It, it, when Squanto in the story of the pilgrims um, landing in, in, and ha celebrating their first Thanksgiving with Squanto, the Indian who appears, he is the last survivor of his tribe near Plymouth. Uh, fishermen had brought European diseases long before the pilgrims. And there's you know, stories of this over and over and over again told. So this is, this is a four century um, unintended holocaust, you'd say. This email, genocide. this emailer wants to know, could you talk about what it was like to put together the best history essays of 2006, which is your newest? Right. Well, um, I didn't do the choosing. There was a committee of nine people who represented a different uh, fields for the most part. A, a nice composition as far as balance of interests and, and types of institutions. And they did, the, they did the reading. We divided up the reading. Uh, of articles. What we were most concerned about was to have a very wide net and to get every history article that had been written uh, in that enclosed time period surveyed, canvassed. And, and there, are, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, so that was quite a task. Uh, then what I did was just run the election, as it were, and introduce the volume. I um, sent out the ballots and, and we narrowed it down. Each, each person on the committee got to recommend, I think, three or four 
articles, and we all read all those articles. And, um, and then from there, we just did votes until we had the top 10. And then um, I read them, as I said, and, and I did the introduction. It's the first volume of the best articles in American history. There's a second volume uh, that's in the works now, and we hope there'll be continue to be more, because it's a, I think it's a wonderful idea for the public to be able to get a book that acquaints them with the best scholarship in American history during that past year. Now, I was looking at the names of the historians, and for someone who just reads history and doesn't know a lot about the inside, these are not names I know, with the exception of Joseph Ellis. Gordon Wood's in there, isn't he? I don't think so. No, not in this one. Ralph Luker. Right, Luker. Uh, Thomas Sugu. 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 Mm -hmm. Matthew Lassiter. Charlotte Brooks. Eric Avila. Daniel Avila. Mm -hmm. Avila, thank oh, you. No. no, Eric is one of the writers. Ah. That's not the committee. Oh, those the are the authors. Ah, those are the uh, no. That's what I meant. Oh, I meant that I oh. didn't. I don't know oh, 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 a lot I'm of sorry. the names I'm of sorry. these I authors. Th I, I thought you were talking not, about the no, committee. Not no, not the committee. No. Uh, no, I think that's true. I mean, they're they're younger scholars. Uh, older scholars tend to write more books than articles. So that's a tendency. Uh, articles are what the way in which young scholars. Um, get their work before the public, often before their first book is published. Uh, that isn't true of all those. They're not all young, but primarily they are younger. Uh, so that's another good, good reason for it, because it, it does acquaint you with the scholarship that's being written right now. I want to ask you about it. Maybe you'll hear from them and you'll know about them another 10 that's years. That's right. Maybe that's right. Well, is there, is there another generation coming along? Oh, there's always a generation coming along. Yes. I mean, um, history graduate work is very popular. People, people who love history want to spend their life reading and writing history, I think. I want to uh, ask you about Joseph Ellis, but also in conjunction with uh, Stephen Ambrose, Doris Kearns Goodwin, other historians who have, for one reason or another, found themselves in the middle of controversy, either because of what they've written, how they've written it, or in Mr. Ellis's case, how he taught his class and what he told his class about his own experiences. You've now been through all this. What, how did you feel about all of this in the last, what, six, seven, eight years? Oh, I think it made me uh, disappointed and sad. Um, I, I, you know, we're all human. We, we do these things, but I think that we all tend to be kind of identify with our team, as it were, and mm -hmm. wish that we didn't have you know, scandals, if you want to say it, uh, break out. As I said earlier, I don't think they're more now than before. I just think they're getting an attention that they hadn't before. This is not about a scandal, but you also did a review of uh, Edmund Morris's book on mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan, and mm -hmm. you were very critical of the way in which he wrote that, putting himself into the book. What I was critical, because I really wasn't as critical as a lot of other people uh -huh. on that book, what I was critical was about was his not letting us know. I think that there is a kind of an informal contract between authors and readers that if you're producing a work of nonfiction, it's the best of your knowledge a work of nonfiction. That it, it is what you think, believe to have happened or to be true or accurate or comprehensive. And he didn't do that. He slipped himself into as a character. I said the book was just fine with me as long as there had been a notice of it in the book itself. There was something in the dust jacket, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think that even was after the dust up that they, they changed that. That was, that was what I was critical about. I'm, I'm very, I care a lot about this contract between the reader and the writer. Uh, why? Hmm? Why? Why do you care a lot about I, the contract? I guess because I think society is held together by trust. I think it's extremely important. I think we feel that about the businesses we deal with. We feel that way about our teachers. And I would say that, so you mentioned these other controversies. They did tear a little bit of that trust. That's, that's what I think is sad. I, I think uh, particularly in a society that's as free as ours and we're unencumbered in what we do, to a large extent, then trust, you know, keeping your words, keeping faith with your fellow woman and man is, is very important. Next is Carson City, Nevada. Oh, thank you, Connie. Uh, it's comforting to know that Joyce was once a newspaper reporter. I'm a TV news reporter here in a small town in Nevada. It, it gets pretty interesting because we get to see the whole vertical integration of, in, of, of, of our schools and, and what's going on in the street. But I, I, on the, on the uh, No Child Left Behind issue, I'm very, very curious as to how um, 
Ms. Appleby would frame uh, this whole drive for, you know, test. I mean, to teach, test, teach, test, teach, test. Uh, I see so many teachers, the fire going out in their eyes. Uh, I see so much disappointment. People retiring early. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it's almost like a top-down uh, kind of um, kind of an edict, you know, that, that that oftentimes robs students of the opportunity to to learn, to reflect, to bring their full humanity to the moment of learning. And uh, I have have there been any other of these kind of attempts at standardization uh, and top-down type education in our history? And and could she kind of frame where she thinks maybe uh, this whole no child left behind? Uh, uh, Movement is going. I mean, obviously, it's more than movement; it's part of the law. But, but just how how it's going to impact, you know, the, the learning of history, the learning of, of of what things mean, rather than just teaching, about, you know, a few paragraphs and then testing and then that whole nine yards. It seems to be almost like, you know, like a poison pill for public education. Well, I, I see from the way you phrase the question where you stand on it, and I'm certainly sympathetic with that. Um, I was a part of the na writing the National History Standards, and that was a question of determining what 5th and 8th and 11th graders should know. Uh, and it was sort of a, gave a comprehensive of list. It was a way of which really helping teachers um, learn about the new scholarship as well as the old scholarship. And that had nothing to do with testing. That was simply advisories. I thought that was extremely valuable. I agree with you what happens with testing. I mean, it does, particularly with a lot of pressure put on the teachers, and, and the children then just become, you know, they're just drilled to say this or that, and they even have, you know, not mantras. Instead of really understanding what they're saying, they have phrases that describe something about the Missouri Compromise, you know, or the Sherman Antitrust Act. That's very bad. On the other hand, I do believe we've got to have some way to ensure that our, in the schools, history is being taught substantively, that there really is um, content. And I think that's more of a problem than perhaps you're willing to, to uh, um, acknowledge. So it, what I think what we're trying to do is to find a balance, and it seems to me that the No Child Left Behind is probably tilted far too far towards the testing. But I don't think that we should assume that if you don't test, every classroom is going to be one in which the teacher engages a student in reflective examination of the history, because I think uh, that's just not the case. It takes very, very good teachers to teach the substance and also engage the students in discussions of the meaning of the past or different opinions they might have about it. The substance has to be delivered first before you can reflect on it. And that, that I think we should have, keep our eye on. What is the substance? What is the quality of the substance in the schools? Next, Los Angeles. Do you think it's unusual there are all these Westerners? There are a lot of Westerners. Yay. <laughs> Um, a few years ago, I read Ben Franklin's autobiography, and I got the impression that he got a, made his fortune by kind of getting a monopoly on the government printing contract. Um, how much um, was there going on in the revolutionary period of using those connections, you know, for profit, in, you know, the same way there is today? Thank you. I think it's a little different than today. Yes, he did have the legislature's printing business, but this was true of every newspaper in colonial America. That's how they survived, uh, was to get the government business. Now, if you had a town like Boston, you could afford to have, or New York, or Philadelphia, you could have several newspapers so that, that uh, just one of them would have the advantage of being the, the legislature's printer. But it was an extremely important financial foundation for newspapers. Newspapers rarely have made money on uh, circulation alone. All our newspapers are supported by the ads uh, in them. So I don't think that's really an example of uh, government business uh, malevolent contacts and contracts. That was just standard. The legislature of every one of the 13 colonies gave its business to one printer. And that printer then usually had the wherewithal to publish a newspaper. You had an op-ed fairly recently in the Los Angeles Times, I think, with Gary Hart? Oh, yes. What was that about? Well, that was about this issue of the constitutionality. That was uh, saying that, uh, remember earlier, someone asked me if I thought that, that some of the initiatives of our present administration mm -hmm. were unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I did think they were. That's what that, that op-ed addressed. It addressed what the idea that we felt that we were... Um, in a constitutional crisis. I guess, again, the, the Hamden v. Rumsfeld decision really spells that out pretty carefully. I, th 
uh, to put it in a nutshell, we had a situation in which a war was publicly discussed as a war on terror. It was never declared. Uh, it's not a war in any traditional way. It's hard to know how this war on terror could ever end in any kind of a peace treaty. So the war that is kind of a, obviously a very grave situation fighting terrorists, but it doesn't really fall into the category of a war that begins and ends. So we have the president as commander in chief assuming powers uh, that are never going to end, greatly expanding the presidential initiative. And what I loved about the Hamden v. Rumsfeld decision is they reasserted, as our petition had, that the war powers are shared between Congress and the president. And, and people will say, well, Congress voted to give the president uh, the authority to go to war if he wanted. Well, that's just like knocking the ball back into the president's court. That's not taking the responsibility for declaring war. The, the Constitution gave that to Congress because they knew that the members of Congress were those people most in touch with the people who were going to have to pay for that war with their blood or with their money. Um, and so there's a sense that they would best know what the impact of this would be. It's a very different thing to get up and vote to declare war or not to declare war, as opposed to simply bouncing the ball back into the president's court and saying, okay, you have the authority to do this. Where is the finger of blame there? Is it Congress then or the president? I don't like fingers of blame, <laughs> but I do think Congress has been pretty supine. And, and they're just, we have a feeling now that they're just beginning to assert their authority as they see, you know, there's also the issue of the signing statements uh, in which the president interprets the law. The Constitution is very clear about Congress passing the laws and the president executing the laws. Did the Founding Fathers um, plan or think that the Congress would be supine? Supine? Mm -hmm. No. No, I think that's what's missing, uh, is that they assumed that they'd be very jealous of their powers, that they would not want the president or the courts encroaching upon them, and that they would, yes, they might have different opinions and be rivals over certain policies, but they would feel a corporate identity. And that, that was very interesting when Congress did, when Pelosi and Hastert did act like a body of congressmen and being upset uh, recently with the president's initiative. I mean, feeling that the, that was when they um, uh, went in, the FBI went in and, and uh, with a subpoena in uh, uh, Representative uh, Jefferson's office. Mm -hmm. And that really offended Congress. Probably the president does have the power to do that. But at any you rate, think so? I think so. But again, I'm not a constitutional authority, but I was just so thrilled to see them come together and say, wait, this is Congress and you can't do this. Here's another email. Please tell us about the program on which you were on at the Association of the Bar of the City of New York oh. with Chief Justice William Rehnquist in 1994, trying Thomas Jefferson for hypocrisy. Well, you know we're going to show some of that. Yes, in this, this person didn't realize that, but we are going to show a little bit of it. When, where was it? Who it was, a, it, it, it was uh, in 1994, and it was a fundraiser for the New York Bar Association. And they, um, I guess bar associations do this, they decided what they would do for this fundraiser was to put Thomas Jefferson on trial for hypocrisy. I think extravagance was another issue, but hypocrisy was the main one. And they got uh, Chief Justice William Rehnquist to be the judge, and uh, James Charles Oglethorpe, who mm -hmm. is a professor of law at Harvard, was the prosecutor. And there was a prosecuting witness, and then Drew Days, who was the solicitor general, is now a professor of, uh, of law, a law professor at Harvard, was the defense attorney, and I was the defense witness. It was, it was a, a wonderful, a wonderful trial because we won. Um, but it, 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 um, Chief Justice Rehnquist obviously was angry with Jefferson because he gave really a hanging judge's peroration to the jury, and the jury was the audience of some four or five hundred people there. And then he, he had a sergeant at arms, and he, he called for the, all those people in favor of conviction. And I don't know, about 80 hands went up, and, and they counted all these 83 votes, and they said, those for acquittal, and about 400. And he started counting. He said, oh, no, we don't have to count. And, and uh, I later asked him, I said, why, why were you so hard on Jefferson? And he said, oh, Jefferson's all right, but he's just had too much attention. I think Alexander Hamilton should have more attention. And I kind of agree with him. I think Alexander Hamilton should have more attention. He has had this past year, bicentennial of his death, his untimely death. Um, 
but that it, it was lots of fun to participate in that. The the thing that was you could be fault Jefferson. Well, I won't I won't say anything. It's going to be in the break. That's right. And, and I described the hypocrisy issue. Here's a little bit of what it was like it was again 1994, 12 years ago when this mock trial happened. Uh, I'd like to turn to the third charge against Thomas Jefferson having to do with his view of the Bill of Rights and his record with respect to freedom of the press, and freedom of religion, and the treatment of slaves and, and women. Uh, since so much time has been devoted by the prosecution to the issue of, of slavery, uh, I'd like you to address Thomas Jefferson's views on uh, first the importation question. I attempted through questions on cross-examination to elicit some of these points from uh, the expert for the prosecution, but I, I think it would help the jury to hear uh, perhaps more concise and, and precise uh, statements with respect to that particular issue. Well, I think it's important to see that, that internationally in, in terms of a, of a nascent, a beginning anti-slavery movement um, in the late 18th century, there were really two issues. One was abolishing the slave trade so that there would be no increase in the number of African men and women stolen and, and, and sold into slavery, and the other was to get rid of the institution itself. Uh, in the first, I think Jefferson's record is very good. Um, he was certainly a part of the Virginia House of Burgesses that would, would like to have have uh, embarrassed the, the sale of slaves in Virginia uh, during the colonial period, and, and they were frustrated in doing that. He also um, had proposed an elimination, well, he also, as, as you described, um, made sure that at the first, at the earliest opportunity when the slave trade could be abolished, which was not until 1808 because the Constitution had prevented any legislation on the slave trade. It had said nothing about um, um, ending it. It merely prevented the end of it for 20 years. And Jefferson makes sure that a bill has passed Congress and is on his desk ready for signature at the earliest opportunity. So I, I don't think there's much of a, of a, uh, a doubt about where he stood on that. Would you like me to go on and talk about well, slavery? I, the, the charge here is one of hypocrisy. Uh, now, you've talked about his position on the importation of, of slaves. But what about emancipation itself and uh, if you could go beyond discussion of emancipation to a discussion of his, his views of the uh, nature of the Negro, as he called it, or the black slave, uh, from his standpoint and the extent to which his position reflected uh, hypocrisy, which is, as I said, the charge. Right. Well, certainly he saw it as a very vexed issue, and he was certainly aware of the contradictions between slavery and a natural rights philosophy. It's hard to understand how he could be charged with hypocrisy because he shared most of these opinions with his contemporaries. And in his one book, Notes on the State of Virginia, it is there that he uh, describes his, the, the suggestion, he says, of Negro inferiority. This is a published book. This is something that he is exploring as a possibility. But even more moving in that book is his description of what slavery does to both master and slave, the boisterous passions that it, un, that it unleashes, as he says, of a most degrading submission in the one and a most overpowering arrogance in the other. And he talks about this, that the slavery is an institution that teaches um, both whites and blacks roles that are profoundly undermining of, of human dignity. Now, this is a, a, a man who is, as it were, burying his soul in this book. So it's hard to see, the, as I say, the charge of hypocrisy. As far as slavery is concerned, I, I don't believe he could see his way through to the emancipation of slavery in Virginia, given the attitudes of his fellow planters. But he does see the possibility of halting the spread of slavery. And in the, uh, he proposes, when he's a member of the Continental Congress, that none of the land that has been acquired in the Treaty of Paris, the land between the Appalachians and the, and the Mississippi, that none of that land should have uh, slaves brought onto it. And that proposal is defeated by one vote, which uh, very chastened and, and crestfallen Jefferson comments about where was God in his heaven when that vote was cast. But this idea does bear fruit. Uh, in the or Northwest Ordinance of 1787, uh, Jefferson is then in Paris when this is passed, but in it, as you know, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the extension of slavery is blocked 
in the Northwest and in, in the five states to become that. That was Jefferson's idea, and he planted it there. All this week on C-SPAN, beginning at 5 p.m. Eastern, in-depth. On Monday, our guest is Francis Fukuyama, author of the best-selling book, The End of History and The Last Man. Then Pulitzer Prize-winning author and Mark Twain biographer Ron Powers on Tuesday. Wednesday, Taylor Branch, whose final volume of his trilogy on the civil rights movement was released in January. Author Shelby Steele comments on race relations in America on Thursday. And Friday, Atlantic Monthly's national correspondent and author of the bestseller Black Hawk Down, Mark Bowden. That's all this week beginning at 5 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. Go online to cspan.org for all listings and times. Troy Appleby, we're back for part two of our conversation in depth. Uh, our viewers just saw a list of your favorite authors. Now, it might look, might look unusual to somebody who was listen, watching and listening to an, a historian of American history. What is your interest here? Well, I wouldn't say that these are my favorite authors. I, I think what I said uh, was that these are the people I'd read recently. Ah, uh-huh. I just, uh, I find that fiction is a wonderful way to get into another, another world. And like most Americans, I think I'm very interested in the Middle East in a way I wasn't before. Uh, so I have read quite a few uh, Middle Eastern authors, and then I'm very interested in China. And, and in fact, I, I went to China twice, and I was with, with historians in China who studied the United States. And, and, and so I have a certain number of email communications, and I got an email from a, a Chinese graduate student who actually wanted to know something about Jefferson. And so I told her, I said, by the way, what are, you major, what are you doing your research in? She was a graduate student. She said, Chinese literature. And I said, oh, give me the names of some contemporary Chinese novelists. And she sent back three or four names, and so I, I got their novels. They obviously are pretty well known because they've been translated and published in English. Uh, so, so that was it. No, George Eliot is probably my favorite, <laughs> favorite uh, novelist. Um, uh, you were, it, it, when you wrote the Thomas Jefferson book, where, where, where did you write it? How did you write it? I wrote, I wrote that one at home, and I had already retired. Um, and. Um, it was wonderful. I had all all the research material I needed within three feet, four feet, because I'd studied Jefferson for so long, and because it was a presidential biography, um, I could write it without doing extensive research, um, or I should say extensive fresh research, because I had all that research on cards and, mm -hmm. and in, in computer files and whatnot. So I did it. So you use both, um, just in terms of uh, the 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 way you write, you use both, and, and research, you use both cards and the computer? I use the computer more now, like most people. But I use cards. I used to say about the Inheriting Revolution, which we talked about, mm -hmm. where I followed the lives of several thousand Americans born between 1776 and 1800. I used to say that I used the most up-to-date research techniques possible. I put all my information on four by six cards, which were filed alphabetically in an empty shoebox. And I still have a lot of shoeboxes around with four by six cards in them. Um, but as far as taking notes from books, uh, and that would include all the autobiographies that I read, I, I have files now. I have computer files. I take them by hand in the library, and then it's amazing. You can take notes. Um, maybe other people aren't like this, but you, I can take notes, and a day or two days later, type up those notes, and can't even remember writing those words. So it's very good to have to put it into a computer, because you have to familiarize yourself with those notes again. I want to know a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? 
Or where were you born first? I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, and I lived there until I was seven. My father was with a large building material company, and he was then in his early 30s, and he was sort of being promoted to larger and larger uh, territories. He was in sales. And so after the age of seven, I moved every two years. I lived in um, Dallas, Texas, Kansas City, Missouri, Evanston, Illinois, Phoenix, Arizona, and then my family landed in Pasadena and never moved again, Pasadena, California. Mm -hmm. So when I was 14, almost 15, I moved to California. And do you have brothers and sisters? I do. I have an older brother and an older sister. My sister is now dead. Uh, my sister was eight years older than I, and my brother was six years older than I. So I was a good deal younger than they and grew up under their uh, benevolent domination. What else about your youth that you'd want to tell us? Well, moving every two years, mm -hmm. I, I had the experience of having to um, get along in a new, in a new setting frequently. And, and that's not very comfortable. I think every time I heard we were going to move, I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed uh, because I would have to leave all my friends. But I did discover, uh, I, think it, I think it gave me a certain flexibility and a certain capacity to move into new situations. Which, I, which, in the long run, I think I benefited from. You were widowed at a fairly young age. Yes, I was. I was 51. And my husband was, I think I mentioned earlier, he was mm -hmm. in the newspaper business. We met, actually, in a history class at Stanford, the, the entering history class, History of Western Civilization. And when I, I got a, a PhD when I was 36, so it was the second career, as it were, third career, really. And... Um, I think he'd always wanted to be an historian, and as I said, he thought, if I could do it, he could do it. And so he resigned from his job and got a Ph.D. in history, and we taught together at San Diego State. And uh, he died of a heart attack, and he was 51, and it was after that that I moved to UCLA. How old were your daughters at that time? I have a daughter and two sons. They, well, uh, they were 27, 23, and 19. And my daughter is the elder, and then I have two sons. And where are they now? My daughter is in Fayetteville, Arkansas. She's just moved to Fayetteville, and uh, she is the mother of a 29-month-old um, twin boys. I think we've got a picture of them here. We can show. Yeah, there, there they are, John and Andrew. I, I'm hoping they'll recognize me on the TV set. And my older son lives in Vermont, Mark. And he uh, has two daughters, Hannah and Flora, and they're now late teenagers. Hannah's a sophomore at Sarah Lawrence, and, and uh, Flora just graduated from high school and is going to take a gap year in uh, Rwanda. Would you at that age ever have thought of a, doing a gap year in Rwanda? I sure would have loved it if someone presented the idea to me, but no, it was not something that I could do. I, I mean, I graduated as the war was still going on. And this is your youngest son? That's my uh, son, Frank, and he lives in Culver City. And who is his father? Andrew. Y your current husband? Yes, and my late husband, yes. Oh, your late husband. I'm sorry. I, you are married now, though, right? No. You are not married no, now. No, I never, I never remarried. Yeah. Let's take a call from Brunswick, New Jersey. Hello. Brunswick, New Jersey. Yes, uh, it's a pleasure, Ms. Appleby. I have a comment followed by a question. Our founding fathers believed that our government should be open and transparent. However, in 2001, President Bush signed an executive order permanently sealing off from the public all presidential records going as far back as Reagan's presidency, including the former President Bush and all records regarding the first Gulf War. If an historian like yourself wants access to these records, you now have to get approval from the White House. So my question is, how do you and other historians feel about this executive order blocking access to information? And has any president in our history ever taken such an action to keep information from the public? Well, I, of course, uh, am very much opposed to that. The American Historical Association, which has its headquarters here in Washington, D.C., it's headed by Arnita Jones, uh, works diligently to keep the Freedom of Information Act uh, vigorous and to not have it contracted and to open up archives of, you know, of all sorts. So as 
very much in historians' interest and the public's interest in having access to these documents. I don't know that any president has ever signed an executive order like this, but I do know that people in power tend not to be as enthusiastic about open records when they're in power as they were when they weren't in power. There's a kind of a tendency to want to husband them. Doesn't mean I'm in trying to excuse this executive order. It just seems I think we have to be balanced to the fact. I mean, beautiful example is Thomas Jefferson and newspapers. He frequently made bold statements how I couldn't have a, a free society without newspapers. But by the time he left the White House, he said he didn't read any newspapers. He kept the Richmond Enquirer and that only for the ads. He was furious with the press coverage he had. So there is this tendency, and that's why it's important to have institutions like the American Historical Association and other institutions fighting against this tendency of those in power to want to keep their records secret. When were you president of the, what was the name of this? American Historical Association. And what is it? In American Historical Association is composed of, of um, I mean, anyone can join it, but primarily the members are those people who uh, teach history, usually in universities, but also uh, in the public schools, as well as a lot of uh, community college teachers. And it's the association of historians who teach all kinds of histories, Chinese history, Russian history, American history, and the like. Um, it holds an annual meeting in which the scholarship is presented, and there's a big book fair. The Organization of American Historians is, about, is for historians who write American history. And that would include people in Brazil and France who write about American history. So it's devi defined by the field, and the others defined by the calling. Next is Mesa, Arizona. Good morning. Hi. Qu question on, on two books, and a question on a constitutional issue, and then one brief statement. Book number one, Clinton Rossiter's Political Philosophy of the American Revolution. Uh, its value and relevance as a contemporary classroom instruction book. Second book, Charles Beard's Economic Interpretation of the Constitution. Same question, is it, is it worth reading in a classroom? Uh, original intent, what would the founding fathers have thought about the rather strained and awkward uh, measures we take to separate church and state, which of course is not in the Constitution? And I will say that as a former teacher at secondary and college level, I think the state of historical education in this country is abysmally and inexcusably low. And I very much enjoyed this program. Thank you. Well, Clinton Rossiter uh, died, I think, in 56. So that would be uh, a g excellent history for historical knowledge and interpretation up to that point. Charles Beard, of course, wrote an economic interpretation of the Constitution of the United States in 1912. Uh, Beards is by far the more um, influential book because he was the one who insisted that you couldn't just look at the founding fathers and their political ideas, you had to look at their economic interests as well. And he suggested that the economic interests were really the most important interests. That set off uh, 40 years of scholarship looking into economic interest period. And that's how we got all the, the farmers and merchants and debtors and creditors into the textbooks that I read when I was a girl. Um, they're both fine books to read, but they certainly aren't going to bring you the, the newest scholarship, which, which is a great deal more comprehensive, and I would say more complex. Um, as far as the Constitution and the separation of church and state, you're absolutely right, that isn't uh, in the Constitution, that phrase. It's a, it's a line from a letter that Jefferson wrote to some Baptists in Connecticut uh, about the, who, wanted, who wanted him to proclaim a day of celebration and thanksgiving for his election. And he declined uh, this because he said it was not the role of the, of the United States government to declare a day of thanksgiving because there should be the separation of church and state. But the First Amendment is very interesting. There were several, because uh, the First Amendment, of course, is the one in which it, 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 it prohibits the Congress from making laws respecting religion. And it had a much more restrained wording. One of the options was to say that Congress couldn't play favorites for religious groups, but could share any funding with a lot of religious groups. And that fo a form of the First Amendment was not passed. And the one that passed is, is a, a great, I think, it supports uh, uh, effectively uh, non-governmental in intervention uh, in religious matters um, pretty effectively if, if you read it. So I don't think that it's extraneous, though it 
All those things always require interpretation because they set down a general principle that then has to be addressed to a crash in the public square in Akron, Ohio. And that always takes some interpreting. Harbor Springs, Michigan. Hi. Hi. I um, have a book in front of me that I'm wondering if uh, Ms. Appleby has, has read. It's um, titled Sally Hemings, and it's by a Barbara Chase Ribaud. And I've, I've found it to be a very interesting personal type of book. Uh, there's a lot of, of history and things that were going on throughout this time with this uh, quadroom slave that was uh, his mistress. But they had a very interesting life, and, and I feel he, he treated her with respect and gave her prominence in his life. And, and I, I've read it twice, and I'm about to read it a third time. But I was just wondering if you had read this or knew of it. It was copyrighted in 1979. Yes, I, I do know of it, and I uh, did read parts of it. I think a lot of it is fictional. I mean, it's based upon a real uh, person. But we have absolutely no way of knowing what their relationship was. The only thing we have connecting them is the fact that Sally Hemings was a slave who came into the Jefferson household with Jefferson's wife. In other words, it was a part of his wife's property uh, that she lived at Monticello for the rest of her life, that she went to Paris, accompanying Jefferson's um, second daughter to Paris when he was the minister to France. Uh, and then now, since 1998, there are DNA tests that have shown that a male Jefferson was the father of Estes uh, Jefferson, who was uh, born after Jefferson left the White House. Um, and in all probability, Jefferson is the father. Even though there are 17 or 18 male Jeffersons around, he was the one that had access. And I think that everybody in the Monticello Foundations believes that, that he was the father of Sally Hemings' child. But that's all we have. I mean, it's an outline. It's a factual outline. But the nature of their relationship would be very difficult to affirm. And I would go further to say that such a relationship in his day would have been seen as a real scandal. Uh, if it were an open relation in which he and, and Sally took walks around Monticello or touched one another. He lived most of the time in Monticello with his daughters and his grandchildren. His elder daughter had lots of children. So it seems very unlikely that there was a lot of personal interaction. Did you have any personal reaction to this whole period of time that we went through with all the DNA testing? I did. I did because I very much thought that Jefferson uh, had not fathered a child. This had been... Th this was a campaign charge in 1805 when he ran for re-election. Um, so this was something that's been in the public record. It wasn't new. It wasn't <laughs> new. And, and it had been revived again in the Journal of Negro History, I think, in the 1930s. Uh, and then uh, Fawn Brody in Jefferson and Intimate Biography had made a very strong case that he had uh, had a relationship with Sally Hemings. And I did not think he had because, at least in, in uh, that campaign, he disavowed it indirectly in a couple of personal letters. He said, of all the calumnies that had been spread about me in 1804, the only one is that I did pay court to my neighbor's wife. Um, so it, 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 was, it was shocking. I'll tell you why it was shocking to me is because Jefferson was so against mixed births, mixed mixture of races. He was very much against it in terms of Native Americans and whites in the West, his plan for the West is a, this mixture he really disliked. Uh, he was very forthright about the things that he, f that he felt, and he certainly felt that about mixtures of slaves and, and slave owners or, or white people. So it, it was, it took a lot of thinking through to figure out, you know, who is this Jefferson? I, th I think I know. Los Ojos, California. Yes. I uh, was watching a C-SPAN program just the other evening where you had Christopher Hitchens on, and he's written a book on Thomas Jefferson. And one of the things he brought up was Thomas Jefferson on the war with the Barbary Pirates, sending the American Navy out and keeping it from Congress until the Navy had gone so far there was no attempt, there would be no way to call Stephen Decatur and that force back. So it looks like preemptive strikes and presence from the early 
stages sometimes took it upon themselves to, to not uh, let Congress uh, interfere with they, which what they thought would be a very important military action. I wonder what the professor has to say about that. Well, I think it's an unusual circumstance. Congress was not, when Jefferson was elected, he was elected in that time you were inaugurated in March, and Congress was not going to sit until December. So there was this period of quite a few months in which there wasn't any Congress. The new Congress was going to meet in December. And Jefferson was very concerned about this, but the Barbary pirates had attacked. They had attacked our flag and they had attacked a ship. And he felt that he had to respond, and he did respond. But the minute Congress was uh, in order, in session again, he reported to it right away and asked for approval for this retroactive approval, as it was. I think this is a kind of situation in which the president, who's, as it were, always in off on call, always responsible, has to make a determination, and there was no Congress for him to consult. He certainly consulted widely with his cabinet. Brookings, South Dakota. Hi. I uh, appreciate having the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'd like to ask the doc, professor her opinion of the impact that uh, the revisionist histories that have been written in the past 20 years are having on the history field. Well, you know, revisionist history is a kind of a loaded phrase because it's never seen as a very um, positive adjective. Let me just give you an example of, of what I feel about uh, revisions. People are very resentful of having any history in the history textbooks that's different from the one that were in the textbooks that they read. Uh, and yet, I was giving a lecture in a chemistry classroom a few years ago, and I looked up at the elemental chart, and there were 102 elements. Now, when I was taking chemistry, there was something like 91. But no one says, oh, those revisionist chemists, they've added new elements to the, to the elementary, to the periodic chart. How can they do that? Revisionist history is new scholarship. And whenever you find out something new, you have to incorporate it into the story you tell. Just, just look at the explosion of research on American history, say from 1965 on. Enormous expansion of higher education. You can't get a PhD without, in history without doing a piece of original research. This cohort of historians and their successors were very curious about slaves, not just slavery, and immigrants, not just immigration, and women, not just the suffrage movement. They did this research on it, and now it has to be incorporated into the other knowledge that we had. And that's what goes on in every field of inquiry. New knowledge has to be incorporated into the old. That's usually what people mean. Uh, I mean, that's what I mean by revisionist history, but that's not what people usually mean by it. They, they think it's um, tenured radicals who are sort of making up stories and, and interjecting all sorts of unfamiliar people into the American storyline. And of course they're unfamiliar because they hadn't, there had been no knowledge about them before. And now we have all of this new knowledge. Los Angeles. Yes, uh, thank you for taking my call. I have a question that goes along sort of the same lines there as, as far as revisionism. Uh, a lot of times the current Bush administration, when pressed on their activities, uh, as for example of leading up to this war or other things, uh, rely on futures history looking back and, and you know, claim that they will be cast in a Trumanian light and that, uh, that history will forgive them for everything they've given here. And I would like to have uh, your comment on that and as well as uh, what uh, what the the neocons? If you could give us uh, an example of the or how the neocon, neocons are involved in this sort of uh, policy making. Well, I think that uh, George W. Bush is not alone in in summoning history. I think I think maybe Richard Nixon was the first one. But historians are uh, I mean historians uh, presidents often will say this is the first time in history that such and such or history will evaluate this differently and they look at the the reappraisal of Harry Truman who was held in pretty you know low esteem right after he left office and then became a very uh, popular and admired um, president and I think every president since Harry Truman is hoping that he uh, and maybe in the future she will be evaluated uh, in a in a Truman-esque way, um, I don't know how. I absolutely don't know how historians are going to treat George W. Bush. I think the way he is treated will depend 
a great deal on things that are happening right now that are happening in now and in the concluding years of his administration. If things go very well, then I think historians will take a favorable view. If they continue going badly, I think they will, you know, appraise him. But I do know that the opinion, interpretation of his administration won't stay put. There'll be successive generations that are going to interpret what he's done uh, and, the, and the initiatives he's taken and the tendencies he's emphasized and the ones he's ignored in terms of what's hap what happens in 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50. I think that's unsettling to us. We just like to tie it down, but that, that just isn't the way his history works. This email is from Montgomery, Alabama. A.D. Griffith writes, would you talk a little bit about the origins of the political parties? I've always been particularly interested in Madison's role since he goes from speaking against factions in the Federalist Papers to helping Jefferson form the Democratic Republican Party. No, that's a terrific question because I've often mused about that because the, 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 the questioner is, is referring to Madison's 10th Federalist, which is probably the most important Federalist paper. And, and in it, he explains why. Well, he starts off by saying, most republics have died. And he talks about the mortal disease, not, you know, not just a bad cold, but the mortal diseases for republics are faction. And then he goes on to say that the minority factions and majority factions, and a faction is a group that, is, that wants to uh, act against the interests of some other group or the long-term interests of the whole. And he said, we don't have to worry about minority factions because the majority rules here. But we really have to worry about majority faction, which, of course, what he's really saying is what we really have to worry about are majorities, which is a little hard when you have a democratic government and the majority has the power. And his solution is, well, if we have a large republic, if we extend the orb, there will be many, many, many interests. And it will be very hard for one interest to dominate, and you have one majority faction that's going to do in the other people. So it sounds just interesting. It's sort of like saying if you have 15 religion, it's a lot better than if you have a small country with two religions in which everyone has the, you know, the, the votes is going to do in the other. Um, and then, as the, the, as the caller shows, uh, Madison is Jefferson's right-hand man when Jefferson organizes an opposition against uh, the Federalists. Jefferson thinks they're going in a very elitist pro-British way and, and organizes an opposition and he and Madison take a famous botany trip upper state New York to talk to Governor Clinton in Albany who's a, a Democratic governor of the state of New York and the, the botany is always seen as kind of a cover for the fact they really want to make some political alliances. Um, I think that m times change, you know, needs change. This is six years later. Um, I think also probably um, Madison didn't feel like they were forming a faction or even majority. I think they were struggling over how to, in, how to interpret the, the revolution, how to interpret its meaning. And I think that he was entirely persuaded that Jefferson was right, that there was a threat to what they thought they'd fought the revolution for. Wayland, Michigan. Hello. Um, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Appleby what she thinks the founding fathers would think about the role religion plays in politics today and with the election. I feel that um, there, it's playing too big of a role and um, what she thinks the, found, the founding fathers would think of that. Well, I think the founding fathers would differ in what they thought of that. I think those that were from New England um, were used to having ministers have strong opinions and give sermons in which the, the uh, members of the town council and the governor, lieutenant governor would, would listen. I think they would think that it was entirely appropriate to hear what the religious leaders thought about an issue. Um, I think that those people who were Baptists, and the Baptists were one of the fastest growing denominations then, had a very strong historical tradition that the church should not interfere with politics and politics should not interfere with the church. A very strong desire for this separation. Uh, so I don't think that you can have the, lump the founding fathers all together. I, I, they depend a lot upon their experience. The Angl Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church in the South, was not a very strong church. It was pervasive, but they had very weak ministers in that they, the vestry, that is to say the members, sort of controlled their appointment year to year. They were very reluctant to invest them for a lifetime. And this kept, this kept a certain amount of control over the clergy, not all the clergy, but predominant clergy in the South. So I think they would have had a different 
attitude than those people from New England. Sisters, Oregon. Hello. Good morning. Hello. You're on the air, sir. Go ahead. Hello. Good morning. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, my question is about the Dutch settlement of New Amsterdam. And um, it seemed like the Dutch were kind of whitewashed. Maybe it's too strong of a word, but their ideas on trade, the tolerance of religion, their finance, everything that was done before the British covered everything over and took over. And there was a great book put out by Mr. Sordo, the island at the center of the world, and he's bringing out a lot of facts and information about all this. And I've never read much about it in history books. And I just would like to, your opinion on um, how this goes into your book about, uh, which I haven't read yet, about inheriting of after the revolution. Is there a lot of ties there with the ideas of finance and things like that? And I'll hang up and listen to what you have to say. Um, Van Buren was a, uh, came from the Dutch background, becomes a, a president. Um, that's probably the strongest part of the Dutch heritage that you'd find in inheriting the revolution because, of course, the Dutch had not been officially uh, in New York or, uh, for uh, over a hundred years by the time of the uh, American Revolution. I think the Dutch were extremely important in the founding. I mean, they did found uh, New York, it, but the, the, um, their influence definitely tapers off after the English uh, succeed in taking uh, New York away, renaming it New York. Duke of York is Charles II's brother. He gives the province to uh, his brother and is run as a proprietary colony. Um, I think the the influence is very you know very present in Manhattan or the place names and and uh, as you say there was this tradition of tolerance. It was a kind of a merchant's tolerance that they had, but it was, it was an important example. It's often referred to why it was important in the colonial period. It's because there were so many different churches, so many different languages spoken in New York uh, that people could instant it and say, look, people of different ethnic backgrounds and different religion can live together uh, in, in peace and harmony. So that was a, a living example. But if you look at the long number of years of colonial history and national history, you'd see that the Dutch ruled for only about 40 years. Washington, D.C. Uh, hello, thank you for taking my call. Uh, Dr. Appleby, with respect to the depth of knowledge you have of history, I'd like to ask you to please take a moment and reflect on, on the current situation we are in today, where despite having the economic means, the democracy, technology and all, we still live in a world which tolerates hunger and war and this growing divide, especially in this country between the very rich and the struggling working class, which is unable to use all the tools to utilize and, and, and fight for, I don't know, a minimum wage, raise health care, um, and, and the, to check the constitu with constitutional powers the presidency, which seems to be breaking laws in the way it initiated war in Iraq and carries it on. What is the way forward? Thank you. I'm afraid that I'm, I'm just like you in, in seeing the way forward. I'm, that is not anything that, that I know about. I, I'm, I'm an historian, but I share with you the concerns you have. Uh, they, they bother me a lot. I'm, I support a group in Los Angeles that was able to get the living wage um, ordinance passed for uh, city employees, including all the people that work for contractors with Los Angeles, like those at, at the International Airport, LAX. I think the living wage movement is extremely important. It, it is, you know, as a citizen, it's extremely, it, it's distressing to think that our Congress wouldn't even pass a small increase in the minimum wage, which is the lowest it's ever been. I, I think that in our, our tradition we have two um, values, liberty and equality, which often are in tension. Uh, I think probably the best way forward, as I think about it, is to return to those values that we had, which definitely were supportive of every individual's having an opportunity to develop in her way and his way. And we can't have that if we have a large population that's uh, in poverty. It's extremely important for Americans who care about this to be politically active. Um, historians aren't going to help us here, but citizens who perhaps uh, know their history and admire the fundamental values will be perhaps energized to do more in the in the public realm. Has this country always had this divide to this extent? Yes. The economic divide? I think so. Mm -hmm. What was it like in Jefferson's day? 
Well, it's dramatic. You have a fifth of the population enslaved. It's the largest, represent the largest proportion of African Americans in our history. It was, uh, I mean, in just in, in numbers. Um, was there was, a middle it, class? Hmm? Was there a middle class? Yes, there was a middle class, and this middle class is growing because this middle class is composed of farmers and retailers and professional people, and um, Americans are moving into the richest land uh, that, that the nation has before they got to California. Um, and, of course, they're, they're putting in sweat equity in bringing these lands into cultivation, but you know, a man can go out with, if he has two or three sons, and, and take up a new, enough land to leave the sons with a, a farm that will support them. Um, so there, there was an expanding, rapidly expanding middle class in the early decades of the 19th century. And that middle class benefited from slavery. And, uh, they would have, the South would have made as much, would have made money from cotton, but perhaps not quite as much without slavery, but um, it's a different situation. But in the white population, there's a, uh, there would be a, a tighter band. There wouldn't be the extremes. Richard Metter from Richmond, Virginia asks, as a professional historian and author, do you feel that making the book entertaining detracts away from the scholarly aspects of the work? No, it certainly doesn't detract, but it's hard to do because scholarship involves conveying a lot of knowledge. I mean, I just said things about the statistical representation of African Americans. Well, the statistics aren't very interesting to read. If you want to get a history that has the structure in which people live as well as the narrative, you've got to put in those background statements, and they're not as entertaining as if you just tell the story of George Washington or Daniel Boone uh, and leave out what is structuring their world in terms of, of uh, mortality rates and, and uh, the quality of the food and the communication and transportation system. All those things tend to slow down the storyline. Next, Chicago. Yes, uh, regarding the caller's question uh, about the Founding Fathers' attitudes towards uh, religion and politics, it seems interesting that uh, today the Northeastern states, the New England states, are much more secular and have less involvement, religious involvement in politics. And perhaps the southern states, where there are more fundamentalist religions like the Baptist, etc., have uh, have a greater involvement in politics. What? Uh, how do you how do you uh, reconcile this complete reversal of roles? Well, it's. Uh uh, you put your finger on it. I think that that the South has been the way the South has been, and it has been tremendously influenced by uh, evangelical Protestantism and the revival message from the early 19th century on. Uh, whereas in New England, they the churches that are more uh, that have more members tend to be what we call sort of mainline churches: the Presbyterian Church, the Congregational Church, the Methodists. Uh, Baptists are, there are many, many different kinds of Baptists, so I don't think we can lump them all in the, in the same uh, category. I guess it's just how those religions have, have developed. Uh, when I was a girl, the mainline churches were much more involved in politics in the sense that they did let their position known on various issues and uh, uh, National Council of Churches and various groups like that that we don't hear too much from now. I think they're beginning to become more articulate as they see that they're point of view on Christianity and the Christian, uh, the way it impinges upon political issues is not being heard. Uh, so I would say that it was really sort of the development of an evangelical Christian dominance in the South and uh, perhaps also uh, moving into the West, taking advantage of the new media to have an impact on politics and the other churches sort of pl now playing catch up. But the difference between the, the two regions is that the South stayed with the evangelical churches and the North pretty much stayed with their traditional churches. There are lots of exceptions to this generalization, but that, I think, explains it. This emailer is uh, asking about your politics. She says, I'm taping your three-hour show for my son, who's a history teacher, but now you say that you're a liberal Democrat. Would not your politics color your view of everyone in history? She says, my son is a conservative. Well, I think you're right. I think it's hard not to have your views colored, but I certainly try uh, very hard to avoid that. I, as I say, I, have a very, I take a very positive view of the way in which the free enterprise economy developed 
uh, in England and in the United States, a colonial period in the United States, uh, because I try as much as I can to see it in terms of, of the participants in history at that time. Same thing is true, I'm an ardent feminist, but that doesn't mean that I find crypto-feminists in the colonial past or the early national period. I see that, that women had a variety of values uh, and they uh, took advantage of different things in the society to explore their potential, uh, but I, I don't assume that they are pressing against bars that are keeping them, them down, though I, I do recognize the, the role that culture plays in shaping all of our expectations. It's a challenge. It's a hard challenge, but if your son is a history teacher and a conservative, it's what he also faces when he tries to represent the various reform movements. I'll say one thing about American history is we've always given more attention to those people that wanted to reform society. It's probably because they're, you know, they're there, it's an activity. There's motion, motion. There's signs, there's slogans, etc. Uh, so that in general, we don't give as much attention to the people who are happy with the status quo and prefer stability over change, even progress. Let's go to uh, Washington D.C. You're next. Go ahead. Hello. I'd like to ask about uh, Jefferson's character. You uh, mentioned the uh, puzzlement about uh, the Hennings affair. But uh, he's gotten a lot of other criticism in some recent books. Comes across as quite vindictive in the uh, Aaron Burr trial, and uh, politically manipulative in McCulloch's books. And I wonder, uh, do you think some of that is unfair, or just that uh, there are a lot of different sides to, to great people? I don't agree with much of it. I remember I was driving <laughs> in North Carolina in, 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 on a Sunday, and I can't now think of the NPR reporter, but at any rate, he was, he was interviewing someone who said he looked to Jefferson for moral guidance. This was a man who had a column about morals, and, and, and this uh, NPR reporter said, Jefferson, for moral guidance, he was so devious. Well, I practically ran off the road. I was thinking, where does this idea that Jefferson was devious come from? The same thing with being vindictive. I think Jefferson was outraged at what Burr had done. He felt that Burr had been conspiring uh, with the Spanish to ch hive off a chunk of the West to join with the Spanish uh, provinces in Mexico. He thought that he was taking money from the British, which he was, and I think that he was indignant. Jefferson was a kind of expressed moral outrage. That was a very strong, we might say, perhaps that's a fault to be morally indignant, but he was. He did have a very strong sense of values and could be outraged easily. Uh, vindictive, I don't see. He thought he should be brought to trial for treason. A lot of other people thought he should be brought to trial for treason. He probably was treasonous in what he was doing. Um, I don't think that Jefferson was particularly manipulative. Jefferson was a, uh, he was a bringer together of people. His cabinet was quite unusual in that he listened to everybody. He was very much influenced by them. He, he had dinner parties. Uh, he tried to have dinner parties with the Federalists and the, and the Republicans together. The Jefferson party was called Republicans then. And then they were too contentious and he didn't like all that contention or dinner and so then he had them separately. Uh, and I'm sure he talked about politics, but I don't think that Jefferson was manipulative. Jefferson has a lot of critics, and I suppose what is looked at as consensus building to one historian looks like manipulation to another. Mound House uh, is a, uh, Nevada. Go ahead. Yes, um, I was wondering if uh, the author sees any parallels uh, between today's war on terror and uh, the Barbary Coast Wars of the early 1800s. Not really. The Barbary pirates were just, they bribed countries. They said, you know, we control the Mediterranean or we can at least wreak ha havoc on your trade. Give us this a uh, uh, million dollars, two million dollars, and, and we'll see that your ships go through with, with safety. I mean, it was, a, it was a, what do we call this? It was a protection uh, racket. Very different from the terrorists today. We'd asked you to name the outsta some outstanding scholars of the uh, American history, and you gave us Bernard Balin, Edmund Morgan, Gordon Wood, Gary Nash, and Jack Green. What is it that they bring to the scholarship? You know, I realized I should have had J.G.A. Pocock. I think what they uh, bring to scholarship well, is enormous talent. That is a talent to conceive of research questions, to design the research, and then to bring it to fruition in beautifully written books. 
and, and that's, that's just an incredible talent that you cannot help but admire. All of those people, including Pocock, have done a lot of writing. There's a lot of scholarship, and they have a very strong point of view. They, there have been certain things that they've been interested in, and because of that, they have been leaders. Other people have followed them. Uh, in the case of Morgan and Balin and Green, dozens of graduate students who are now well-known historians. Um, in the case of Gary Nash, graduate students to be sure, but really a whole generation of social historians followed him. Uh, Gary Nash was the one who wrote a book called Red, White, and Black that made the point that America's foundation, there were three races. Before that, there had just been an empty continent and Europeans came and then they they settled and then they brought slaves and, and it was just, the whole story was about those European settlers and Nash's perspective is now found in every single textbook of American history. You start with those three races. It's, uh, it's, it's an interpretive decision but it seems to me a very um, defensible one and comprehensive one. So I think that's what I admire about them is their enormous talent, the fact that it's sustained through a long career of scholarship, that they have very strong voices, and that they've been influential. Go, uh, let's go to uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. Yes, thank you for taking my call. In-depth is fabulous, and Professor Appleby, kudos to you. You're eloquent and articulate, and it's a joy to visit with you, so thank you for taking my call. I teach in higher education, and I work with teachers. And I would like to echo the other callers who have called in about No Child Left Behind. It really is taking the joy and the vim and vigor out of teachers who must prepare students through a test and, and drill orientation. And I know that in higher ed, I feel like we've sort of abandoned our counterparts in the K-12 setting because we don't have to teach to the test. And I know that you had great success in your teaching, and I wondered what you found to be successful as teaching methods and ideas when you taught at your universities. Thank you for your compliment. I think that uh, teaching to the test is dreadful. There's no question about that. But I think we're going to have to come up with some other ways to ensure the quality in public school teaching. Because I think there are probably a lot of schools in which not very much teaching about history goes on at all. And I do think we ought to have a commitment to conveying the substance of scholarship about American history and world history. Then we can talk about interpreting in the student's perspective. I don't think you can have students talking about the past before they know something about it. We have to figure out how we're going to get uh, knowledge into the, to the school uh, curriculum. The American historical, you say that we sort of, we in higher education sort of ditched public schools and left them, you know, to struggle on with this terrible pressure of teaching to the test. But the American Historical Association did participate with almost all of the states when they were planning their standards and, and tried very hard to make those standards as substantive uh, as possible. Um, we probably should do more and, and we're going to have to think of more strategies, but I know that the major historical associations are very concerned about uh, the teaching in the schools. Um, it's just, it's very hard to get a handle on how you influence the teaching in, in 50 states. As for my own techniques, I don't know. Um, you know, I taught in large universities, so unless I was talk, teaching in a seminar, I lectured and I, I spent all of my time figuring out how to render complex material accessible not to simplify it, but to make it understandable. And that's quite a challenge, and I think that I improved slightly over the years, but I don't think I ever, ever, uh, you know, solved the problem, as it were. As you know, teaching is hard work. Las Vegas. Joyce and Connie. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, hi Joyce and Connie. Thank you very much for a wonderful program. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Joyce about uh, what might be termed uh, selective uh, quotation of the Founding Fathers, to use Warren Harding's phrase. In particular, I'd like to ask you about their views on uh, wealth. Uh, um, it's my understanding that they believed in private property rights very deeply, but that they distrusted uh, great wealth and, in particular, uh, great inherited wealth. Yet we didn't hear much about uh, the Founding Fathers' view in the recent discussion in Congress about repealing the estate tax. So uh, I'd be very interested in your views. Thank you very much. 
They certainly did believe in private property. They believed that private property was really the foundation of a democratic government uh, or a republican government. And I think that was because they felt that people should be independent. And so their idea of private property was probably pretty much the uh, print shop that a man might own, or a woman in some cases, or the farm. Um, and they also feared concentrations of wealth. They thought that was the big difference between European countries and the United States, that there was a, a dispersal of property, which there was. And this country was about 80% agricultural at the time, and aside from the plantations, which were privately owned, but also controlled the labor of a whole slave population, elsewhere, um, this property was widely distributed. It's interesting that the, that the Founding Fathers didn't come up in the estate tax uh, discussion. Jefferson's, uh, Jefferson has kind of two views on this. He was very pleased that, they, that uh, Americans didn't practice primogenitor, which was to leave the bulk of an estate to the first son. Uh, the British did this, practice this, because they wanted to keep that aristocratic family together. And so his view was that you should have as, you know, as wide a dispersal of, of inheritance as possible. On the other hand, he said, to take from one because him or his father has exercised the skill and in industry to acquire property and to give it to another whose father or he have not used the same industry and skill is violates the first law of association, I think, which is that everyone deserves the fruits of their labor. So to use the Founding Fathers, you can't selectively quote. You're going to have to go back and get a full picture of what they thought the role of private property was in the, in the society and the way in which it impinged upon politics. They do get rid of the, uh, they are, and their peers, and their younger peers particularly, are getting rid of the property qualification for voting. So they very much oppose that. Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask the guest a question about uh, the study of uh, history at the graduate level in higher education. I know here in the uh, local university uh, where I uh, in the uh, community where I live. Uh, several years ago, there was an internal study done, and the uh, university uh, debated the idea of uh, just doing away with graduate education here in this university because they thought uh, the resources of the uh, university could be uh, better used in uh, technology, science, business education, capitalistic invest. Uh, endeavors, what, uh, et cetera, and I just, uh, I don't know if that ever was actually put into effect, but I know they did study that uh, proposition, and I would just like to ask the guest, uh, does she see that across the country? And also a second question I would have, uh, she said she was a newspaper reporter at one time, and uh, I would just like to ask, uh, does she see this current administration as being uh, an enemy, so to speak, of freedom of the press. And those would be my two questions. Thank you. I don't think that every university has to have a graduate program. Uh, every university has to gra have to have a graduate program in every um, field. It, graduate programs are expensive. They take more time from the faculty, and they take resources. Graduate students usually have to have money so they can visit archives. Um, it, it's very important in history that the university have a large library. Now, with internet resources, that may not be as important as it once was, but it's still very important. I think that it's entirely possible that for many universities, money could be better spent on the undergraduate program. Um, so that would be my opinion on graduate education. Graduate education is, after all, training professionals. And uh, like some universities don't have medical schools, some universities don't have law schools, and I don't see why every university has to have a graduate program in, in every field. Um, the second part of your question was about newspapers. Freedom of the press. Freedom of the press. Um, I think this administration is very unhappy about leaks. It started out with a, not having much of a leaky vessel in the White House and it sprouted some leaks. And uh, this means that newspapers get stories that the administration would not like to see in print. I don't know. I think it's, people say that it is, is much more secret than previous administrations. I would say that it was started out being much more disciplined. It's a discipline that really counts, is whether you get the people who work in the White House not to leak. Um, and I think that that's a common goal for the president, 
not to have policy decisions or, uh, you know, leaked before um, the decision has actually been made. I think that's understandable. And I think it's also understandable that um, presidents are unhappy when newspapers do publish things. And as in the case of the, of the ba surveying bank, bank accounts and um, eavesdropping, um, I think there's a certain, you know, real anger that this has come out. But I certainly think it's important that newspapers do this, and I think the newspapers are, publishers are, and editors are very careful about republishing something that they think would actually be injurious. It's that gray line between what's already out there and isn't going to be, you know, influence, say, something to do with, with terrorism. Uh, that is, is probably people take different stands on. My conviction is that, that newspapers and and by that I extend to television media that it's extremely important that they get the information to the public. I think that the newspaper, I, I say newspapers because I'm old, uh, the news media to cover all of them um, have been pretty uncritical of politics in this last decade and I think they could do more investigating uh, and um, publicizing of what's going on in the government. It's very little that the public can't benefit from knowing. You said earlier that at it, when you were 36 you got your PhD in history and that that was basically your third career. What were the other two? Uh, well I started out in journalism. I left when I uh, graduated. I went to New York and I worked for Mademoiselle magazine. And uh, that really wasn't in journalism though I did do a, a follow-up after I left them. I was actually doing some merchant in merchandising campaign for them. But then subsequently I did uh, research for Mademoiselle articles. But my real stint was working for the Pasadena Star News. I was a stringer, and a stringer is somebody who is just is given a certain community. I was given the community of South Pasadena to cover the news for the Pasadena Star News, and I did that from my home except for going to Board of Education and City Council meetings because I was then a mother, which leads into my second career, which is really as a homemaker from the birth of my daughter until Nine years later, I started graduate work, but then I could still do the graduate work and be home, and, and it was another six years before I was teaching. Tell me about Douglas Adair. Douglas Adair was a wonderful man. Douglas Adair was my professor at uh, Claremont Graduate School. He'd come from William & Mary College, and he was the editor of the William & Mary Quarterly, which is the most important scholarly journal in the field of early American history. And he. He put it on the map. He took the third series and he made it the most important and subsequent superb editors have continued that tradition. He was a southerner. Uh, he went to Suwannee. He was from North Carolina. He had a very soft southern accent. He'd done his doctoral work at Yale and he'd worked on Jefferson and Madison. And these people were like friends of his. He would say, old Jamie, you know, he practically had a nervous breakdown. The people, everybody he knew was out there riding their horses and gambling all day, and he was with his books, and he was very lonely. <laughs> he was, I'm making it sound too folksy, but he did, he did, he was, it was just infectious, his love. I, I, I went to graduate school. School. I wrote my, I don't know, whatever you write, prospectus or something. Other. I was going to study the late 19th century. I met Douglas Adair and changed all that and uh, changed to um, colonial history. And another person you said influenced your career was uh, Sidney Mead. Sidney Mead. Well, Sidney Mead was a, probably the most distinguished church historian, religious historian in America in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Certainly one of a handful of distinguished ones. He come from Chicago Divinity School and he came to uh, Southern California and the Southern California uh, uh, Theological School and it was adjacent to the Claremont Colleges where I got my degree and so I could take a field with him and I did and he took, before that American religious history had pretty much been denominational history. People wrote the history of the Presbyterians, of the Methodists, the Baptists and he and a cohort. He wasn't the only one in a cohort of Stuart Martin Marty, who is very active in public life today, is one of those who looked at uh, American religion and tried to interpret and analyze it in terms as a, as a pervasive cultural influence in American history. And uh, he had a superb conceptual mind and also was a, f what I say he's a fluent writer. It reads like he's fluent. Actually, he took a long time on everything he wrote. Um, and one of my fields was American religious history in the, in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Next, Cincinnati. Hi. 
Hi, I'd like to thank you for C-SPAN. Dr. Appleby, I'd like to ask you a question concerning the uh, Bush administration that is serving our country today. In the beginning, we were attacked by 9-11, and ever since 9-11 has happened, our whole country has been in turmoil and chaos and have seen less true information about the war on terrorism because in the beginning it was the war on uh, Saudi bin Laden but you ever barely ever hear the uh, president speak of him anymore and then he took it from bin Laden to Iraq and from Iraq to war on terrorism any and everywhere in the world and what I feel is that the things that he continued to feed the public and the secrecy of his administration, I feel that our nation now is becoming under a tarrant president rather than a diplomatic nation that we have always been. Thanks, caller. I have to I have to remind the caller that I'm an historian and I am an historian of the 17th and 18th centuries so I'm really not an authority on contemporary politics I can only speak as a fellow citizen uh, on these matters and uh, I don't think the country's in chaos um, I happen to be against the war in Iraq and I was beforehand um, so it's I'm not sympathetic with this policy uh, I'd like to see more diplomacy and consensus building among nations than Americans taking the initiative in this way but I, th I think the uh, the answer to even a secretive president is a very active electorate it's citizens asking for questions and, and informing themselves and I know that sounds sort of you know girl scoutish but it is true this is a democracy and we have a lot of influence but it takes our time to have informed opinions and to be active in groups, uh, political groups, to get our policy uh, advocacy forward. Gordonville, Texas. Hello. Go ahead. Hey, hello. Um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Appleby what her opinion would be if we had not had a revolution against Great Britain, we would have had a parliamentary system uh, slavery would have been abolished completely by 1838. There would have been no revolution. There would have been no uh, civil war, probably no World War I, and a parliamentary uh, system of government perhaps would have been better than what we have today. We also wouldn't, perhaps might not have had the extreme religious uh, fanaticism that we have today. What is your opinion if we had remained in within the British Commonwealth. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I think we can get part of the answer by looking at Canada, which remained within the British Commonwealth, and in many ways it's very much like the United States. In other ways, it's, it's not. I don't know why you think the British would have been able to abolish slavery or even wanted to abolish slavery. After all, the British abolished slavery, and they had no slaves. Uh, the, the, what slaves they had were in distant colonies, the remainder of the British Empire after the American Revolution. So it's hard to say what they would have done uh, if, if the colonies had remained a part of Great Britain. It's, it's, very, it's a lot easier to abolish slavery where there aren't any slaves than it is to abolish slavery where you have a large number of influential people and a large number of your property tied up in them. After all, in the North, they did abolish slavery a lot faster than the British abolished slavery, starting in 1780, and by 1804, every Northern state had put slavery on the road to gradual abolition. Um, so I'm not so, I'm, I, I don't share your, what seems like a, a rosy view of the improvement in the United States had we stayed with Great Britain. I think, as I say, the example of Canada suggests that we would be not all that different. I do know one major uh, area that has been, uh, research has been done on, and that was the Canadian reception of the immigration that began at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, when you had large numbers coming from southern and eastern Europe, bringing in a large Catholic and Jewish populations that had not come into the country before. There'd been a small Catholic one and a larger one with the Irish in 48, but this is really the big immigration. And the Canadians tended to be very Anglo-focused, and they wanted to be an English 
country, and they, the immigrants were sort of encouraged to go to the West, whereas the United States had this idea of the melting pot and of being a country that could take all people. Now, the temperature on the melting pot wasn't high enough to really thoroughly melt it, but it nonetheless was a pretty important ideal so that I think that we integrated more people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds uh, than Canada, and I think it has created a very different ethic in the United States. I think there's a, a tremendous amount of pride in our capacity to assimilate people. And you might say, hey, what about this immigration controversy now? And that's true. We're, it's being challenged again. But I have no doubts that we will integrate this um, immigration population as we have in uh, preceding decades. So I think the countries would have been morally different, but economically and politically pretty much the same. We have about 15 minutes left with our guest, Clinton, Connecticut. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. We had um, a question a bit ago about um, private property. Here in Connecticut, we've had a recent uh, Supreme Court, actually, uh, ruling on eminent domain where the city of New London had taken private property for a private enterprise under the logic that the expanded tax base would be good for the town and everyone in the town. And I'm wondering um, your opinion of this, given the, you know, the original intent of the Founding Fathers. Well, again, I'm not a constitutional lawyer or a constitutional historian as such. I was very much opposed as a citizen to that New London uh, ruling, sort of shocked by it. Um, and I saw in the paper a couple days ago where the last property was purchased by the, the city and the protesting New London families. It's been pretty, I mean, using uh, eminent domain, uh, uh, it's been pretty consistent in American history to use it. We certainly used it for the building of the railroads. Um, Maybe this idea of improving the tax base and moving families out and building, you know, building a mall or whatever, or the or this often frequent condemnations for building a stadium. Maybe they're carrying it too far. I wouldn't be surprised if there were another constitutional case or another case come before the Supreme Court that might pull back on that ruling. So it's a mixed picture. It's certainly you can see examples in the past, but probably not quite as. Um, liberal as this use of it. This emailer wants to know a little bit more about the original reason for the Electoral College. Uh. And, uh, and she asked you to assess its relevance today and whether it should be abolished. I'm all for abolishing it, but it's going to be very hard. Uh, the original intent of that, I think, uh, the thinking was we want the people to participate in voting for everyone. They participated in voting for the representatives directly. They participated in voting for the state legislatures, which originally chose the Senate, senators until that uh, constitutional amendment provided for direct election of senators. And then there was this idea, we want them to vote for the president, but most people don't really know who the leading figures are. Better for them to vote for prominent people in their neighborhood because they are prominent, they will know the national figures, and so they will indirectly uh, elect the president by means of this electoral college. That was just immediately knocked out of the picture with the emergence of, of political parties. In 1800, when Jefferson was elected, there was a tie vote for him and his vice president because voting discipline was so strict that every person for Jefferson voted for both Jefferson and Burr, even though Burr was clearly to be the vice president. So the Electoral College, in that sense, was didn't function the way the Founding Fathers thought it would uh, because it doesn't really function once you've got political parties organizing the vote. Now what it does is give an enormous power to small states because the real error, if I may say this about the Founding Fathers, is that they should have had the Electoral College reflect a state's representation in Congress. That would be a true reflection of its population. But no, they added two senators to every state. So Delaware and Idaho and North Dakota, I mean, there are a whole bunch of, of states, I think about nine of them, that have only, no, that's probably too many, six, that have only one representative, but they have two senators. So that is a 200% increase in their presidential voting power. Whereas California, with its 54, maybe 56 now, representatives, 
the two additional senators represent a very small increase of power. So I think it's very unfair. I think it's weighted to these small states. That having been said, we haven't had very many elections in which the popular vote was different from the Electoral College vote. Even 2000, if you think that those people in Palm Springs didn't, at Palm Beach, didn't really intend to vote for Buchanan, they really intended to vote for Gore, and that Florida would have gone for Gore, even then you would have had the Electoral College going with a popular vote. I think if we had two or three elections within a six election span in which there was a difference between the popular vote and the electoral vote, we would get around it. We'll never repeal it because the small states are the ones that benefit from it. I can't imagine that they would vote for a, a constitutional amendment. But there is a movement which is going through the legislatures right now to get the, the large states, those large enough to control an election by the top nine states, to inform their electors that they will vote for whoever gets, whichever candidate gets the popular vote. And that would just obviate the Electoral College. And I imagine we'll have that if, as I say, we have too many elections in which the popular vote is different from the Electoral College vote. Next call for Joyce Appleby is Santa Cruz. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Appleby for giving us her time. My question is, would she make some comments on how and why New York City overtook Philadelphia as the number one city in America in per population and influence? Two words, Erie Canal. Uh, New York has this great harbor. It's more accessible than Philadelphia's ha harbor. Uh, it had a very imaginative governor in DeWitt Clinton who had the capacity to get the bonds in the state to build the Erie Canal. And once you connected the Middle West, or the you know, Northwest, with New York by means of the Erie Canal, then that, that harbor was just going to boom. Um, so I think that's how I would explain it. This emailer asked, it seems to me that Anne Hutchinson is largely discounted in American history. It seems to me that she was enormously courageous in defying the established religion of her community when that religion was the dominant aspect of her community. Do you agree or not? I agree, though I don't know that she's neglected. Uh, you'd have to say neglected in relation to how much time is spent on the Puritans. I think if a certain amount of time is spent on the Puritans, then Anne Hutchinson usually gets a, a fair amount of that time. Uh, it's sort of like what I said, how our histories are really give more attention to reformers. They give more attention to dissenters, too. And Anne Hutchinson usually gets her, her day in the classroom, and she was courageous, independent, and extraordinarily bright. And, and bright and brave to face all of those men who brought her to court and made the, leveled these charges against her. Uh, she was, she was uh, an impressive woman. Frederick Marilyn. Hello, Dr. Appleby. Pleasure to see you on the C-SPAN this afternoon. Three quick questions. How, in your opinion, did the founding fathers view Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector? And number two, referencing Napoleon's quote that the English are a nation of shopkeepers, what insight can you give us into Napoleon's sense of wit? And finally, did you ever meet and work with A.L. Morton or Barbara Tuckman? Thank you. I'll take the last question first. No, I didn't, though I, I appreciate their work. Um, well, Oliver Cromwell plays a role in, in the Puritan New England, and, and they, uh, they see him as, a, as a, a kind of a hero because he was a Puritan, and he did uphold the Puritan principles, though he could also have been seen as a dictator. Um, now, the middle question you were... About Napoleon. Oh, Napoleon. Well, that's a dismissive remark of Napoleon's. That's, that's, a, that's a remark in, from the standpoint that a glorious nation is full of murderers like him. I mean, that a glorious nation has a military presence. They have aristocrats. What do the English have? They have all these shopkeepers. What do they have? They don't have the glory of the French... Uh, empire that he established. They just have the largest city in the world and the greatest navy and the most developed economy. It's just, it's just a put down, but it's kind of a pathetic put down. Norton, Virginia. Go ahead, Norton. Good, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. I can now. I'd like to ask Professor Appleby if she's familiar with the work of Sarah Evans in her book Born to Liberty and the role of women in organizing boycotts against British good sense. We really need such boycotts again to get rid of our own slaves, to paraphrase Tom Hartman and what he, uh, he wrote in What Would Jefferson Do? 
Yes, I, I know Sarah Evans, and I know her book, and I admire it a lot, and I think that we do need more uh, citizens' activity in, in uh, pursuit of public policy goals, like, as I mentioned earlier, the living wage for laborers and, and health care and, and the, the really important measures uh, for enhancing the quality of life and the range of personal development among men and women and children in the United States. Some historians don't like the what-if questions. Do they bother you? I usually and, tend oh, to deflect them. <laughs> this one asked, what, would, what, kind of, uh, what would you believe the Founding Fathers' take would be on a gay marriage amendment? No, I, see, I, there's, there's so much living that has uh, taken place between their age and the present. I just don't know how you could even approach such a question uh, if you want honestly to think it through because you would have to assume that they had lived through all of the changes in society, changes affecting ordinary men, changes affecting African Americans, affecting women, affecting the family, affecting religion, and then get to what they might think with some what you thought were sort of essential qualities that they have. I, I just I couldn't imagine how I'd answer it. Sherman Oaks, California. Hello. Um I am wondering why, at a time when the Christian religion is uh, more present in our national politics than ever before, and we have a president who calls Jesus Christ his mentor, uh, uh, the, uh, and the Bible, the Jefferson Bible created by the president who occupied the same position in his century that George W. Bush uh, occupies now, why don't we hear more about the Jefferson Bible, which strikes me as a remarkable document, and why is it that it's no longer given to newly elected members of Congress, as I believe it was uh, during the first half of the 20th century? I don't know that it was. I've never heard that before. You may be right uh, that Jefferson's gospel was given to the elected members of Congress. I kind of doubt it, but it's possible. Um, it's re it was recently republished. You could get on Amazon and you could get a copy. You know, when you say, why don't people know about things, there's so many things in the American past to know about. Uh, one historian doesn't keep them all in his mind or her mind, uh, but, the, but that gospel is written about and it is available in print. Are you still writing? Yes. What okay. are you writing? Well, I've just begun a book I think it'll be a book. It's hard to say when you start, you know, write the first. I'd like to write a brief history of capitalism, uh, which would be a, a designed for a larger audience, and that would really focus upon the way in which this free enterprise economy, which after all grew within a very traditional society, the way in which it broke loose of those traditional restraints, and what were sort of the key decisions. Um, most of our understanding of capitalism comes from two or three very abstract ways of analyzing it. And I would like to s analyze it historically in terms of these important junctures uh, in the, I'd say, 300 plus years. A review of some of your recent works, Best American History Essays 2006, which is what? Which, what is this book? Oh, it's, oh, I'm sorry, it's a mm -hmm. collection of the best articles that, uh, judged by a committee of nine people uh, on the best articles that were published in American history. And Inheriting yeah. the Revolution? And that's about the cohort of Americans who were born after the Revolution, those between 1776 and 1800, and how they took advantage of the Revolution in their careers, their lives, their religion, their politics. And your Thomas Jefferson biography, is this the only time when you put all of your info on, on Jefferson, Jefferson yes, in one uh -huh, book? Uh -huh. It's a presidential biography. I, did, I do have another book, Capitalism and a New Social Order, which is about the Jeffersonian opposition movement as it develops in the 1790s. But this is the only book on Jefferson, per se, though I've written a number of articles and essays that have appeared in collections about Jefferson. Thank you so much for your time, yeah, thank for spending you. three hours oh, with us. It's, it's been a wonderful opportunity to appreciate it. And thank you to the people that called in and those who wanted to and didn't get through. It was really, really uh, exciting to answer your questions. Have a good day. In Depth with Joyce Appleby re-airs tonight at midnight Eastern. And next set. They put those clocks on their backs and they went out and sold them themselves. And uh, the same way with leather goods. So there was retailing, peddling. In the New England, northern states, peddling was a wonderful opportunity for young men. They would put on their back a bunch of, you know, pans, needles, hammers, tools, cloth, things that were manufactured in the north, and they would go south and peddle them. And they'd often pick up scrap metal on their way back and sell them to manufacturers or turning out brass buttons and the like. So 
peddling was, uh, was another way. Law, there was a great expansion in law, great expansion in the professions in general. A uh, lot of new universities. Um, politics was, all these little towns had their, their political leaders. Newspapers, just exponential growth in the number of newspapers in America. So what was happening inside these young people? What were they developing that their parents would never have been able to, uh, to understand? Well, I think they were developing initiative. I think the older society, some people took the initiative, but by and large, stability was a very strong goal. And these young people didn't care that much about stability. They took it for granted. And so they were taking the initiative. Now, again, I have to remind you that I only looked at those people who were, you might say, out there moving and shaking the world. Right. At least 50, 60 percent of the population replicated what their parents had done. They stayed on the farm. Um, so I think initiative was new. I think early autonomy was new. Uh, I think there was an increase in marriages for love. I have a whole chapter on um, emotions and intimate relations because not I hadn't anticipated having it, but I, I ran into so much that was talked about intimate relations. And it hadn't been done before? Everything was arranged? or was No, no. no. Uh, things weren't arranged, but they were quasi-arranged. People, if you stay in put, and in, in, in most of the towns we're talking about are 900, 1200, 1400, you kind of know who the people are in a cohort. And so it's not arranged, but it's contained. Uh, you, uh, it, besides the individualism, you also talk about the, pe that the fact that the people were mobile. You mentioned that mm -hmm. the northerners would go down mm -hmm. and, and peddle in the mm -hmm. south. What was the south doing? Were they doing the, the same thing? Mm, they, the South was exploding from an agricultural point of view. This is a cotton boom, so the Southerners are moving into Alabama and Mississippi and filling out Georgia, which was quite undeveloped at the time of the Revolution, and South Carolina, too. Uh, the invention of the cotton gin enabled people to grow cotton everywhere in the South, which they hadn't been able to before uh, because they were growing short staple cotton. So it was a dynamic period, but it was a period of the entrenchment of slavery. There had been a period in which it looked like perhaps slavery was not going to be profitable uh, because slavery previously had been devoted to growing rice and tobacco, but cotton saved slavery. So the South was a great deal more conservative. It conserved its traditions. It conserved patriarchal authority. That's what the North loses. The patriarchs lose in the North. Their sons get freedom, even their daughters. Uh, it's interesting, young men thought they owed their fathers their labor until they were 21 and they often sent back money home until they were 21. So the, the, this is a very important uh, divide in northern and southern states leading to finally a northern society and a southern society uh, was the more mobility and, and initiative and communication. What was the impact both in, in the south and the north on the family? the institution of I the family. I think the impact in the North was to put a great deal more pressure on the nuclear family, on just the family of husband, wife, and children, because they were so important. Because the North's moving agriculturally, too. It's moving into the Northwest, and moving into Ohio. And, um, so there was that. And, um, and I think there was still more of a, um, a patriarchal family in the South where grandparents would have been more involved in their children's life. Both it, it, the family was very important in both societies because the, there's still a tremendous amount of work that's done in the family household. So there is a, there is this sense of it's mutual dependence, but there is also the sense that young people in the North get out earlier and form their families in, independently. What about religion? Well, this chance to participate in a discussion with one of today's leading historians. Join us as Book TV's In Depth welcomes Joyce Appleby. Professor Emerita of History at UCLA, and past president of both the Organization of American Historians and the American Historical Association. She's most recently the editor of the Best American History Essays, 2006. Joyce Appleby, in a recent book of essays that you edited, you refer to something called Founder's Chic. You say that the fact that David McCullough's book, John Adams, has sold two million copies is, quote, an indication of just how much the reading public has succumbed to founder chic. What is it and what do you mean by that? Well, I, it isn't my phrase. I don't know who thought it up. But it, it refers to the fact that in the last 
I'd say 10, 12 years, there's just been dozens of books written about Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, notably, mm -hmm. with the McCullough biography, Benjamin Franklin this year. Um, and people are just seem to be lapping up these books about the founding era. There are, many books are about two or three founding fathers who are either rivals or studies of character. Uh, it's, it's been sort of fascinating. I became aware of it when I was asked to review books, and I would never, rarely would I be given one book, I'd be given four books to review because they'd come out at the same time and they all dealt with the founding era. Now, there have been a lot of books over the years written about oh, the yes, founding fathers. Right. Does, does that in and of itself um, st uh, say about, what does it say about the two million copies of one book? What does it say I about don't, history? You know, there have been a lot of uh, explanations. I think one, I mean, as you say, it's always been a popular subject. I think perhaps in our time there seems to be more um, ambiguity about our goals or perhaps the, our national identity, and the Founding Fathers just clinch our national identity. They, they remind us that the nation was founded, n you know, a, in a spirit of revolution, but also on the natural rights foundation and that it was seen as a great... Uh, reform movement for mankind as a whole, uh, at least at the understanding of the founders. I think that's it. I think another thing is that for about 40 years among professional historians, there's been a tremendous amount of work on social history, uh, history from the bottoms up, history of, the, of those people who had been silenced in the past, ordinary people, slaves, immigrants, laborers, women. And I think that there was built up a pent-up desire to get back to, you know, you might say, real history. Those guys that fought the revolution and founded the nation and passed the, ratified the Constitution. In, uh, let's see, I think it's been, what, 13 years ago, you wrote the book Telling the Truth About History along with two of your colleagues. Here's one of the things you said, and again, this is 13 years ago. You said professional historians have been so successfully socialized by demands to publish that we have little time or inclination to participate in general debates about the meaning of our work. Is that still happening? I think less so. I think it's less so. I think what I was referring to is the fact that um, historians of my generation and 10, 20 years younger came in in the great expansion of higher education following the uh, Sputnik, when Americans realized that they were sort of behind in science and you can't beef up science without beefing up the social science and the humanities because we give general education to our students to, for the BA degree. And uh, that research university put a lot of emphasis upon scholarship. And so there was, a, it ceased to be rather a leisurely profession in which you would reflect upon things and it was more one of doing research and publishing the books and going to conferences and reviewing other people's books. And that doesn't leave a lot of time for reflection. But I think, I think the profession as a whole is slowing down I, and, and there are probably people out there saying, oh, what's she talking about? But at any rate, I think there is more of a concern about the meaning. Is it slowing down at all because the, some historians have been um, having problems with plagiarism issues, or I don't think so. No, you know, I don't think that I don't think there's any increase in plagiarism. I think that there were just some very high-profile cases, uh, and 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 also the press played a part in it. Not a bad part, but the press did pay attention to historians. Whereas I think 20, 40, 60 years ago, it'd be kind of a ho hum thing. Um, Instead of me asking the question, I'll go straight to an emailer, and this woman is Patricia Holler, and she said, how would you classify yourself as a historian? Are you a social historian, new left, or neoconservative? And what other prominent female historians have written about the American Revolution era, era and what are some of their works? Take the first wow. part first. What kind of historian are you? I suppose I'm an intellectual political historian. Those are the two fields that I have done my, my original work on. Um, starting with my first book on the sort of the, the foundation of economic, uh, e economic reasoning in the 17th century England. Uh, and continuing with my concern about Jefferson and the Jeffersonians and, and uh, the first generation of Americans. So that's where I am. Um, I don't know whether, I, I think the questioner also wanted to know politically where mm -hmm. I was. Uh, 
Personally, politically, I would say I'm on the left, but as an historian, I'm probably seen as uh, a little right center because I've always looked at the development of capitalism positively and tried to connect it with what I thought were the actual decisions people made that led to the flourishing of a free enterprise uh, economy. And that's led to my having a number of conservative graduate students and because it was seen that I wasn't hostile to these things. Uh, Jan Lewis has written about this revolutionary era. She and Peter Onuf have uh, edited a series at the University of Virginia that have worked on uh, Jefferson's legacy. They did a collection of books on Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Um, other women who were uh, Linda Kerber, who's the current president of the American Historical Association, has worked on the revolutionary era, as has Mary Beth Norton. Uh, and they have, uh, their earlier works, their second books, really, uh, have been on women in the American Revolution. Uh, Laurel Ulrich at um, uh, Thatcher at um, Harvard has worked on women in the um, Revolutionary era. That's a sampling of them. Here are two of your uh, recent books that came out. One, a biography, this sh short biography of Thomas Jefferson. This is uh, from the Henry Holt collection. What yes. is this about? The series. Well, it, it, it's about presidents, and um, probably there are 20, 24 presidential biographies uh, that have so far been published, and I did the one on Jefferson. So it's it's short because the series is is a short uh, series. It, it's it's what I consider um, an airport book. You buy it for a flight home. I I think you could go from maybe finish it by the time you went to Chicago. Certainly by the time you got to L.A. And it's about Jefferson as president. This is, a, this is the whole list of people mm -hmm. who are now mm -hmm. writing about the different, different presidents. Uh, they're, you're at least halfway through. Uh, what do you think about Henry Holt deciding, the publisher deciding, to put this series together? I think it's very interesting. It's been quite successful. And I think, they're, uh, I think people are inclined to read one or two and, and like them and think, hmm, you know, there's some unknown. I don't know anything about Buchanan. I don't know anything about uh, Fillmore. I think I'll, I'll read these other biographies. And, and I think that's an excellent thing. I think, uh, I think political history is important because it's a backbone of history. Whether we like it or not, it is the, the, the spine because policies are made and power is centered there and um, a great deal of the public discourse is shaped by politics. Uh, I'm going to talk more about Jefferson later, but I want to get into this book a little bit, oh. Inheriting the Revolution. Right. When did you write it and what, when, how did you come up with the premise? I think it was published in 2000. Um, Harvard University Press published it. I worked on it for about 10 years. I, there was an awful lot of debate, uh, not debate really, there were an awful lot of assertions about what happened after the revolution, what impact the revolution had on American society. And I thought it would be interesting to test some of these assertions because they really came out of a very generalized knowledge and perhaps the proclivities of the scholar making them. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to study the first generation of Americans, that is to say, those people, the first cohort that was born after the Revolution, had absolutely no connection with the colonial era. They would be the inheritors of the Revolution. And um, so this is what I set out to do. I made it clear that I was going to deal with someone who had done something in public started a business, initiated a newspaper, formed an organization, ran for office, uh, wrote, or and maybe the only thing they wrote was an autobiography. I, in, I included anyone I could find any information on. So there are blacks and whites and women and men, though predominantly it's white men that are covered because they were the ones whose records were, were they were the ones who were taking the largest part in the public life. And I, I, as I've described to people, my, um, my research technique was like a vacuum cleaner. I just sucked up everything that I could find. And I spent a lot of time in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress, reading books from the period, particularly autobiographies. Trying to set my own mind into what that must have been like to be a kid uh, whose parents had fought in the Revolution, but uh, I had 
no concept of it or, or no concept of living under British rule. Right. No having, not having the experience is so different what you inherit as a tradition as opposed to what you experience. I think you mentioned this earlier and uh, I mean I grew up in, during the Depression and the Second World War. Now those were just searing experiences and they shaped the way I thought about my country, the world, poverty, my life, but someone born after that uh, has a very different experience but then it's still resonates so they hear stories all the time yes for me world war ii resonates because my father was was right. there and right. it's the same thing but at the same point in time it's not something that is is really a part of my life how did those ki young people coming uh in the next generation after the revolution first of all deal with politics politics is interesting uh because largely because of thomas jefferson there was a political opposition in the fourth year of the new government under the Constitution and it wasn't one of structured politics it was a fight over how best to interpret the revolution uh, what did the American Revolution mean and this was a very angry period uh, and it persists for about 20 years um, I'll give you an example in one of these autobiographies um, well, Joseph Story, who was a distinguished Supreme Court Justice, mm -hmm. describes uh, falling in love with a girl from a Federalist family, and he was a Jeffersonian, and they wouldn't allow uh, her to marry him. I mean, it was really deep feelings of division. So politics is rather unusual. It's, we talk about our own age being partisan, which it is, but there, it, there wasn't so, many, so much the sort of dirty tricks kind of politics. It was just more real sense of, of suspicion and fear of the other side. So and this, this, so this country that we, get, we had always get a feeling was coming together was really not coming together in some ways? I, you know, it was coming together because politics became increasingly less important in American people's lives. Once the revolution had been fought, the Constitution secured, the presidency passing from one part, one group to another group, which happened in 1800 with Jefferson, uh, it's, it's, it's less important. You asked me about politics and it was mm -hmm. divisive. One man refers to the fact that he couldn't move to a certain town because there wasn't enough business for, for two practices. And you had to have two practices, <laughs> the Federalists in town and the Jeffersonians in town. Uh, but politics itself, what was really wonderful for this generation, particularly for the young people, was the opening up of new careers, the possibility of early autonomy. In and their lives? In your life, but yes. And what, what did they do? Oh, they did a lot of things. One of the interesting things is, is this period, and we're talking about post-1776, is a period of, of great economic development and expansion, not uniformly, really after 89, but by the time these people are, are uh, adolescents. And um, this increase in commerce put an emphasis upon literacy. So one of these things, one of these occupations, was the young men and women became school teachers. Didn't pay very well, but it paid enough for them to leave the farm, and it opened up a larger world to them. And very rarely did people continue teaching school for more than three, four, five years. Then they'd go into retailing. Uh, we don't realize that retailing is a, is, a new, is a new occupation. Before that, other than in the major cities, uh, people, people made clocks. This is a time of the, what's called the Second Great Awakening, a series of religious revivals. The, the, uh, nation-building period, the revolutionary period, <clears throat> people uh, belonged to churches, though relatively few. Um, by, by that I mean there, there, there was a lot of movement and the churches didn't follow in the West. Um, but in the beginning in, in 1798 there are a series of revivals and these revivals hit just about every Protestant denomination and they emphasize a personal religion personal conversion and there's an emphasis more uh, more on personal sin uh, controlling habits uh, but also this emotional uh, uh, coming to Christ and these re these um, revivals change the tone of public life in America certainly not everybody becomes an evangelical Christian but the evangelical Christians pretty much dominate the public life. It's remarkable in the South because the South had been kind of a, if we think of um, sort of this dashing Southern planter who has cocks that he, uh, you know, has cockfights with, he's a wonderful horseman and, and uh, a great dancer when the fiddlers are out. Mm, this evangelical movement stops all that. It's very hard on drinking, on frivolity in general. The South really becomes quite 
sober in the sense of, of, of leaving that frolic past, frolic past. Are, are there any comparisons that could be made with the impact of reli religion on politics today? I think there are. I think once there were the, the evangelical uh, movement was successful, then there was a move uh, to go into politics. One of the big things was Sabbatarianism, to get everything to stop on Sundays. And in the early decades of the 19th century, the mail was delivered on Sundays. It was delivered usually to the post office, because these are rural communities. And, and men would love to hang around the post office and, you know, chew the fat while the wife and the children went to church or whatever. And the Sabbatarians wanted to stop the delivery of mail. They were very unhappy that the Erie Canal <laughs> ran all the time because of course the rivers run all the time so there were barges coming down the Erie Canal on Sunday and this was bothering them. So uh, Sabbatarianism was one. It's the beginning of the temperance movement the te and the temperance movement is very much a part of, of Christian revivals. The temperance movement is fascinating because it cut the consumption of alcohol in half. Probably the most liquor was consumed in the revolutionary era in, in American history. Really? Mm -hmm. It's a hard drinking society. There were no medicines. Liquor was often a medicine. Uh, wars always tend to produce more drinking. Drinking is men leading a separate bachelor's life. Drink. Yeah, and it was it was very interesting. It also has to do with the fact that the workday is becoming more complicated, and and particularly with there's some manufacturing, you know, working and drinking is when you have machines is not a good idea. And but before that, in every shop. The youngest member would go out at 11 and 3 and bring back liquor for the men working in the shop. And so the temperance movement was, uh, it took a long time. It dominates all through the 19th century. And historians had kind of treated it with, you know, kind of as a, as a joke. But if we think of our concern about drugs today, I think we have to see that's exactly how they felt about liquor then. We have a lot more to talk about in that era, but first I want to invite our viewers. Hello, this is uh, In Depth, and welcome to this month's series. Our guest is Joyce Appleby, and she's going to be with us for uh, three hours to take your phone calls and your questions about history, specifically her interest and her expertise in the Revolutionary period, but also uh, English and French history, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. And in what, what types of peri period there? The same period? Oh, yes, always. 17th to 18th and very early 19th. Our phone lines are open if you'd like to join us. If you live in the East or Central Time Zone, 202-737-0001. If you live in the Mountain or Pacific Time Zone, 202-737-0002. We also have an email address if you do, do not or cannot get in uh, by telephone. Here's the email address. It's booktv at cspan.org. And some people have already sent their emails in early that we've been able um, to get in. So let's just dive into Thomas Jefferson. Because